Okay, we are live. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome back to Holy Humanist. Um, we're here, obviously, today for part four of this um, historical look at the um, pagan element and Gnostic um, element in South Arabia at the time of the advent or uh, early, early beginnings of what we consider Islam today. So as always, we have got the wonderful Lloyd de Jung, de Young, sorry, Lloyd, I completely butchered your last name there. <laughs> um, it's been a while. So obviously, um, we've taken a bit of time out between the last couple of parts. Lloyd was away traveling and I was kind of really busy as well. So thank you to everybody who's kind of waited for part four and uh, the little disruption in the series. Um, but yeah, so obviously today, we're going to look at um, part four, the continuation of the presentation. And as always, if you've seen the other parts now, I kind of have been giving this disclaimer out that as we go through the presentation and we talk, obviously, this is purely like educational and historical. Uh, so feel free to like, you know, share your questions. Uh, but please kind of refrain from making comments about things that are just all over the shop or pointing fingers at other people's religions or worldviews. And if you've got questions and comments on the topic at hand, by all means, like this presentation is for you guys. So, um, yeah. So hopefully with that said, um, everybody kind of knows <laughs> um, to keep it real and my mods obviously always do a good job so if you guys can just do what you do as always um, and without further ado I will bring Lloyd on and yeah we can get going Lloyd hello and welcome back thank you so much for being here once again despite all of the uh, recent <laughs> controversy <Well>. we've had. <laughs> uh, no thank you for having me I appreciate it and uh, yeah it's, it's good to be back. Okay, awesome. Uh, so just before we start, um, Jojo Freelancer. <laughs> this is uh, one of the, the, the actors in this whole controversy. So hopefully today uh, you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Let's keep it real. Let's learn together. And yeah, let's just deep dive into what was happening in Southern Arabia. D, hi, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone who's just joining. Oh, that's you, oh, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Norse <laughs> mythology. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Um, so, yeah, Lloyd, without further ado, obviously, the stage is yours. If you just want to kind of if you have any opening comments before before you do, like, you know, get stuck into the presentation, by all means. Um, I just want to say, I, well, well, the, the, the you're talking, Harris. Uh, as I mentioned, as I said to you earlier, I was I was very impressed with with the way you comported yourself, your your professional demeanor in in dealing with with a difficult topic, with a contentious issue. Um, incredibly balanced, very professional. I mean, you would make a very fine journalist, I think, on television. Oh, thank you. You've you've got you've got the perfect demeanor for that. That that would you would be a credit to the profession, I think. And uh, I'm sure as a, as a as a lawyer, you're going to to be, present very fine arguments. You know, considering oh, thank the evidence, you, Lloyd. so I really, really yeah, appreciate ability that. To make, no, you're welcome. No, your ability to make these fine distinctions and to weigh things up and balance them is very impressive. So yeah, I feel you. like that's you're very welcome, and I feel like that's the least I can um, owe myself the kind of decency to do after you leave something like Islam. You want to be as balanced and you know critical in your thought processes for the rest of your life. So I'm really glad uh, because obviously it was it you know it, it was a kind of impromptu conversation, but I completely know why you and I are doing what we're doing, and I think most people who watch us know exactly what our objectives are and what we're trying to shine a light on. And I think honestly, Lloyd, to be honest, I think the fact that people people are getting so irked and the, the fact that you, people like you and I could team up for a common cause here um, is just like like testimony to how seriously it's poking holes in certain things or it's riling people up so kudos because your knowledge is definitely um you know it, it, it's it's touching some soft spots for sure it's hitting some nerves so it's really important and I'm glad we're back for more <laughs> you know no thank you uh for having me here and uh yeah I mean for navigating this Hi, Gigi. 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 Uh, that's good. <laughs> uh, Gigi H. Yes. Um, okay. On that issue, uh, since this question has come up, so Rick Brown and I believe Michael Abdel Masi, they are responsible for a for or the, they're part of the team that translated a book called the Arabic Bible. So, so just briefly to mention, 
However, this particular work has caused major controversy and a major negative outcry from a lot of people, especially Arab Christians as well. And in, in at least one instance, Rick Brown has been accused of heresy, right? So the, the reason being that he, now I've, I've read one of his articles where he discusses the, the, the claim about the moon god. Oh, actually, you know what? Now that you've mentioned this, let me, let me bring this up. I need to find an author. Give me one second, please. Yes, sure. I love it, Lloyd. You're literally back and on a roll from the get-go. <laughs> uh, you um, know, there's an article I need to find. Okay, okay. sure. Just while you find that, okay, um, Netflix is saying, I love how Christians and atheists can get along together. Precisely. That that was the whole point of what I was trying to say here. Um, like, you don't have to be kind of so tunnel vision and dogmatic in your approach that you, you know, you don't talk to people from various sides and kind of realize that there's so much common ground there. So I'm really glad that people are finally understanding that <laughs> this is not the end of the world. And uh, I have the most utmost respect for Lloyd and I'm just so grateful that he's willing to come on my platform and share this. So yeah. Okay, yeah, well, so I'm sharing my screen right now. If you can oh, just yeah, pass sure. it on. Here we go. So that, okay, so so I wanna cover this. I Look, I don't know this guy very well, okay? I, I don't know his works all that well. I'm just going to give you my, my very brief, quick perspective, okay? So, but I want to start with this then. So let's, since I'm here on this page anyway, it's called Islam Science and the Problems at Wikipedia. Okay, so this article addresses the problems faced by Wikipedia with its Islam-related articles. Now, I know that on the, on Allah being a moon god articles on Wikipedia, they quote him, right? Mm -hmm. So now notice at Wikipedia, Islam-related articles are often compromised by pro-Islamic editors. There's right. a 2010 incident where an editor with over 67,000 edits was caught Jeez. intentionally inserting false information into articles. Wow. Okay, okay. this is one guy yeah. who made 67,000 false edits. Okay, he'd been editing for five years and his inaccurate edits and articles had been reproduced all over the net by other websites which use Wikipedia. So if you read this article, now this is called uh, Islam Science and the Problems at Wikipedia, easy to Google, okay? Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is that they tried to clean up what they could on Wikipedia, but he would constantly go back and re-edit them. Or maybe there was a team that would constantly go and go back and undo the changes the editors were trying to make. Eventually, yeah. he was banned under that ID. Who knows if he's active? Who knows how many of them there were? But yeah. understand, if, there's a, if one guy can do 67,000 false edits about Islam, what mm -hmm. can a team of 10 do, a team of 100 over time? Yeah. Right? yeah. And so what happens is if you read through many of these articles, they will use these false edits and these false claims. No one's got time to check 100, 200 false claims in an article. Exactly. Right. So, and Lloyd, if you yeah. think about like, obviously, the, the exponential effect of that, if all these other websites have now used that information and claimed Wikipedia as their source, and that's gone out, the, the domino effect is, is insane there. Yeah. And there's no way to go back and change those. No way. So the, those, the, wow. those claims are out there in the wild, and there's no way to go back and change them. Because See, that was the problem friends. with Wikipedia and the fact that anybody could kind of go in there. So, I mean, somebody had the wherewithal to understand that I need to go and make a change a lot of this or make it a lot more palatable. And it's it, it's also interesting that Islamic websites, obviously pro-Islamic websites and Islamic websites themselves, jumped on that bandwagon instead of just putting up the original source. So sorry, I missed that. I was reading a comment. My <laughs> it's apologies. okay. I was just I was just ranting about Wikipedia, like how Wikipedia enabled this uh, with the lack of um, checks and balances with editors and then yeah, anonymous editors yeah. and that kind of thing. Now understand, yeah. he misrep. So one of the things misrepresenting a source by quoting material utterly out of context. They give examples. Report that a source supports a claim that it does not and explicitly does not. They lie. Claim that a figure invented something. Take a passing comment about something. They they list a whole variety of these, and it's a fairly long. And they talk especially, especially about the Islamic golden age where this guy focused his attention, right? So this is one yeah. area this guy focused his attention. So understand there are some serious, serious issues. Now, I use Wikipedia. It's not my only source, but you have to be very careful with Wikipedia. Yeah. Sometimes it's a very convenient source. On some issues, it's actually quite convenient, but they will take quotes and ideas out of context. They, 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 okay, so they will deceive. Now, another thing, when I mentioned the Bible that he that he wrote, um, so again, I don't have notes in front of me, but so he tries to appease Muslims. He tries to appease the Islamic sentiment. Mm 
So for instance, Nuria, would you agree that within Orthodox Christianity, they speak of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost as the Trinity? Mm -hmm. Right? So th this yeah. is the standard Orthodox Christian view. You have God the Father, the Trinity, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. However, as the three members of the Godhead, however, within this Arabic Bible, apparently what he does is, because not to offend Muslims, what he does is he removes all references to God the Father, all references to God the Son. So okay. he neuters those, and which basically means that this is now no longer Orthodox Christian Christian belief. He's yeah, now appeasing Islam exactly. by modifying the Christian doctrine, and this has been condemned by at least in at least one instance as heresy by someone, and there's been a huge outcry about it. So so I would question this guy's authenticity to some degree. Another thing mm -hmm. I want to bring up is the following. Actually, let me bring let me go get something else that that also um, now. This is a slightly older article, but it is relevant. So this one is called the New Republic, and the the, the so it's in the magazine called the New Republic, and it's called yeah. Moral Hazard: The Life of a Liberal Muslim. This is about a scholar from Egypt who now lives in America. He was threatened. He was even kidnapped. He had his fingernails removed and his toenails removed, or at least his fingernails removed. He was beaten, tortured, hung from a ceiling. He was then just suddenly released, and there was a second attempt made at kidnapping him, possibly to kill him, because yeah. he would not bend the knee to the fundamentalists. He would not, you know, promote the agenda at university. He's a professor, I believe. Yeah. And he received death threats. This man was, as I said, kidnapped. He was. Now, this article is disturbing. This goes back to 2000, okay? 2002. Mm -hmm. And it talks about what happened to him, and it speaks of. It speaks of the money that these Muslim groups pour into academia, pour yeah. into universities, pour into organizations to, shall we say, have them turn soft on Islam. Yeah. Right. And he mentions one scholar explicitly that was writing basically fan fiction on Islam because he was receiving a ton of money. Okay. okay. Read the article for yourself. Another thing that you might find useful is this called the College Foreign Gift and Contract Report. Actually, let right. me do something else here then, since since this question has come up. Now, I'm going to go oh, wrong one. Sorry, my bad. I made a this wrong This was mistake. the question, if anyone's just joined. Yeah. yeah. So this is, unfortunately, this list is not updated as regularly as one would like. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a listing. Now, U.S. universities and educational institutions are supposed to track money that they receive from outside donors. Now, we know for a fact the FBI has prosecuted numerous people, and we know that maybe half of this money is accurately tracked. The rest is invisible. It's dark money. It's, right. it's not. Okay. There are ways and means around this, and they've discovered a lot of fraud. So now if we look at... This is a very long list. Now, I have a video that discusses this in depth, in detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we look at this, um, the total here is, this is $15.76 billion. This is between, I think this is between 2011 and 2018. I think it's a seven-year period in this example, right. 2019. Up uh, 2019 and 20, this is 2019 and 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, yeah. the current total of these foreign gifts given by, now notice here, Embassy of Oman, Embassy of Oman, Embassy of Oman, Embassy of Oman, Embassy. The Omanis are donating a lot of money to top universities in America and the yeah. UK. Don't worry, this, this money gets around. You'll notice yeah. Qatar National Foundation, Qatar Foundation, Qatar Foundation. You'll find the Saudis. You're yeah. going to find Pakistan. You're going to find a lot of Muslim countries are donating a lot of money. For what reason exactly? Now, in this five-year period, we have $15.7 billion. I'd say that buys Jeez. a little bit of loyalty. Now, the I current say it total, does, yeah. If you go to the current one, and some of the figures are two years out of date, three years out of date, the current number is $36 plus billion. Okay, wow. Okay, the current yeah. number. The, this, the, this one is an older one that I prepared for a, a video series I did on... On Islamic money, Islamic finance, where the money mm -hmm. goes, who they pay the money to, their political clout, which is enormous. They have enormous funding and political clout. People have no idea. 
So understand these guys, Abu Dhabi, these guys get around. So, yeah. so when it comes to academia, I'm, I'm more than a little skeptical. Yeah. That, that's a hundred percent. I mean, that that's so, I mean, it's not even plausible. It's necessary to be skeptical. And I mean, you've just shown just one, one of the reasons, but it, it runs deep. I mean, having attended like an institution myself where I know it was also partially funded from, let's just say the Middle East, but I mean, it, it seeps into the entire political agenda, the political agenda tied into the institution. And it actually does hold clout. It most definitely does. Obviously, your donors become a, a big part, right, of, of the way you're going about your even education. Defend. And also, Islamic money is funding kindergarten through university wow. in America. Kindergarten. They, they're influencing the textbooks that are chosen, the textbooks that are written. They're providing textbooks. They're providing content for the textbooks. They're saying, look, write it like this, write it like that. So understand, so you've got amongst all of these things, uh, dude, if Nuria, if I should talk about the money and the political influence, people would be shocked. Oh, they would, you'd be shocked how much money and where this money goes, and uh, it's it it will be eye opening. So okay. Do you have a whole video on this, Lloyd? Otherwise, we we should definitely talk about this. At some I've done point. I've done a couple of videos on this, and I but I have the materials. I have everything prepared. Yeah, so okay, I can show the money. So okay, yeah, there's see. a lot of funny business. And guys, finally, this is this has been linked on Nuria's videos. This is my folder, okay, with all my with all my sources. Currently, there should be 1,297 academic papers and references in this folder. 1,297. Just so, by the way, I have a professional desktop search software that I've bought, right, which indexes all of this and allows me to search through it rapidly, okay? So, hello there, John. So, understand. So, for instance, this, this folder here, this references folder, this is the one that contains the bulk of the work that I'm working with right now, okay? And, of course, so you can see here the Encyclopedia of the Quran, six volumes. There's um, the Brill Encyclopedia of Islam. Again, that costs you about forty thousand dollars to buy a set, okay? And here it is for you. Hell. Yeah, it's forty thousand dollars to buy a set of that. It's it's crazy money. Please don't tell okay? me you paid that, Lloyd. No, I did not. I managed <laughs> to find it. So <laughs> amazing! I was going to say <laughs> you're doing great okay. things, but yeah. Josie Wells, that is exactly what is happening. So, yeah. so yeah, I'm I'm a little skeptical of this guy, uh, and uh, I've, I've I've a few issues there. I don't know that much about them, but from what little I do know, I I'd say there are some red flags I would question. But also, again, I've also you may notice that I've been very very clear. I've I've shown Al Makkah as a moon god. I've shown you about thirty, at least. I'm guessing, let's say, at least a dozen, if not thirty, different references to Al Makkah being a moon god. I've stressed it from archaeologists, historians, you know, there's been reference after reference to moon god, moon god, moon god, moon. And I deliberately stress that because they use like one or two scholars that say otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, think of this. If, if Islam, if Allah is derived from a pagan god and it's a moon god, okay, that's bad. But if they say, no, it's actually a sun god, well, it's still a, it's still a pagan god. Yeah, where's the, where's the benefit? Yeah, either way, it's, it's, Islam is not Islam as we know it or they believe it to be. Yeah. So understand, I have, as I said, I've got 1,300 references here that people can go through. This one in Gnosticism, I've got, these are academic papers, PhD theses, uh, reference works, books. So I, I index these, I search through these, I've read a lot of these. So understand, all of my materials are here. Now, people say Lloyd's sources are weak. I'm sorry, but these are PhDs. These are university professors that are writing. These are some of the best academics. I did not make this up. I'm reading them off the page. I didn't write it myself. Yeah. And then followed by that, there's the source right there for you to go and verify by yourself if, if need be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. hopefully that clarifies. And yeah. oh, by the way, this is the, just so for instance, one of the books you'll find is what's called the Ikhya Ulam al -Din. Okay. So let me, thank you. Just because of this recent controversy, I guess since I'm here now. Mm -hmm. So this book, Ikhya Ulam al -Din, or then you'll see it often like this, okay? This is regarded as the most important Islamic spiritual text after the Quran itself. It is considered the second most read Islamic spiritual text after the Quran, right? Okay. The Ikhya Ulam al -Din. Now, it has been said by Islamic scholars that if the Quran were to disappear, they would be able to reconstruct it from this work. 
Okay. This is Okay. actually something Islamic scholars themselves say. So if the Quran was to magically vanish one day, this is what they would turn to to get the next best To reconstruct. thing. Okay. Correct. Now notice they say that false speaking is permissible. Sometimes it becomes compulsory. Now look, this is a very nice translation. There are other translations that are a little less, shall we say, euphemistic. <laughs> sometimes yeah. lying becomes compulsory. False speaking is better than speaking the truth sometimes. Lying is... See, and if you want to compromise, And that's the watered down version you're saying, right? yes, if you want to compromise between two parties, <laughs> false speaking is lawful, you see. wow. Now, if you are in a disagreement with a Muslim and he wants to bring a compromise to bring peace between two parties, lying is completely lawful. He who Yeah. settles disputes between two parties is not a liar. <laughs> You see, notice, oh my days. Just so the act they of say settling this twice. takes precedence over the act of lying, you know, the, the thing that most Yes. people consider a bit of a sin, at least at some level, whether it's a white lie or not. So this, the lie which is spoken to settle the matters between two contending parties is not written by Allah. He doesn't record it. The lie which is spoken to settle the matters between two parties is not written. You see, it's not a lie. Okay, but also uh, just the analogy to war right above it as well, and like the two scenarios. Yeah, now Islam is permanently at war. Permanently, I mean, the juxtaposition of lying, whether you're lying to settle something or go to war is like back to back. Yeah, I understand. Lying is obligatory in Islam. I was not kidding. One day If I'll not go encouraged, through this if you want. <laughs> yeah. I can do a talk on the Sharia. I can do a talk on Dawah. I can explain Islamic propaganda. It's all forms of propaganda. It is all forms of deceit. You understand? So this is all something that people might... find of interest okay Yeah, so for yeah sure. that that, that completes the introduction sure then we can Okay, amazing. Somebody any questions commented last time, um, they were like, oh, you were 20 minutes in, and then Lloyd said, that completes the introduction, and they were like, whew, I'm already inundated with information. And I was like, yeah, that's usually what happens. Um, but we've done the same thing again today. But I, I love it, because obviously there's just so many pockets of information that we're touching on. And I think the Sharia stuff, um, even just the little snippets you gave us last time of like the actual meaning of Dean and looking into the Sharia requirements to lie, Um, I'm going to separate those and like pull them out as separate excerpts because I think that in itself is just like, you know, we need to kind of just drop that knowledge. But if and then we can do an in-depth um, talk on Sharia as well, if you're up for it and if people are interested, which I think obviously that they, they would be because it's the way you kind of uncover Sharia. I don't think any lay person or Islamic scholar will ever show us that kind of, you know, in-depth, unfiltered like what what it what it actually obliges basically but yeah happy to start now lloyd Yeah, Trevor Griffith says, yes, please, oh please yeah do a video on Dawah. I'm seriously intrigued. And the guy above, Dave Santon, says, you talk so much poop. <laughs> <laughs> hello now, dave and welcome to the show clearly not his real name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly not. Um, thank you, Nor. So let's um we're gonna get stuck into part four. But do we need like a tiny little recap of what where we finished off? Or Yeah, so I guess I'll, st I'll start here a couple of slides back from where we were before. Where I ended sure. was we spoke about Muhammad. Um, Muslims like to claim that Muhammad was a Muslim from birth, right? Remember they said that Muhammad was the first Muslim. Khadija was the first Muslim. Adam was the first Muslim. Abraham was Abraham, the first Muslim. yeah. So it's very clear who was the first Muslim, <laughs> yeah. right? There's, there's no confusion about that, That's right? true. Crystal clear. So... <laughs> crystal clear right and of course it, we actually realize that even within the quran it says here that the way it's written is that muhammad was wandering in error and he was guided right Yeah. so They even had to so do that kind of like open heart surgery thing on him, didn't they, before he could, you know, get the, the revelations from Gabriel. So that clearly shows he had to undergo some kind of change and transformation in order to accept this. And it, and the Quran even says, like, he, he did not know of the scriptures beforehand. Again, crystal clear. <laughs> Correct, correct. Yeah, so notice that he and Khadija worshipped the idols Alat, Manat, and Al-Uzza. They used to pray to Alat and Al-Uzza before going to bed. So Muhammad was a pagan. There, there are numerous references to that, right? Muhammad was a pagan, and of course we know that he was actually, he was consecrated to Hubal, who was the Allah of the Kaaba, 
right, when he was born by his grandfather, right? And of course, he even sacrificed the white ewe to Al Uzza in his youth, right, when he was following the religion of his people. So we know that he was a pagan prior. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so Gigi, Gigi says, thanks for Lloyd for exposing the pro-Muslim articles, including the Wikipedia. It's so important to counter their arguments ah, that Allah is not a moon deity and exposing Rick Brown. Yeah, look, so yeah, this is what I found so far. And these are some concerns that I've raised that have been raised about him. I mean, look, for me to speak, I would have to spend time, like, you know, a few hours researching. I like to talk from knowledge, but from a surface level, this is what I know. This is what I've found. This is what I'm aware of. So hopefully that is helpful to you. But uh, we have to be careful with Wikipedia. So um, so we do know that Muhammad was a pagan, that he worshipped pagan idols. We do know that these idols were often called Allah. So the name Allah as the name of the deity goes way back, well before Muhammad. So Allah as a deity goes way back. Well, there was one other question that Gigi asked. She mentioned Allah. Now, this is, again, I believe something where, where this Rick guy is disingenuous. When, when Arab Christians talk about Allah, Allah literally means the God, right? Mm -hmm. However, that is not the name of the Christian God. The name of the Christian God is Yehovah, right? We say Yahweh, but I believe the, I believe the correct pronunciation is Yehovah, mm -hmm. right? Now, Allah is a theonym in Islam. It's the name of the God. Yeah. There is no other name. He has, he has other qualities, descriptions, right? He's 99 names, which is actually 500 names. In fact, Muhammad even has 99 names. Yeah, he does. But, so, you know, so however, we know that, see, when the Christians use it, it's used, Arab Christians, in a very different context. It's the God, Yahweh. Whereas in Islam, Allah is the name so the, these are two different contexts in which they're used so so there's a little bit of sleight of mouth going on there as well you know so i'm, I'm a little skeptical just a tad skeptical i would need to dig further to to speak more no thank but, you guys uh, so, okay, you, you are 100 percent right i mean even when i was in egypt and i heard the bible being read in arabic my first initial thought was when i'd heard the word allah was uh, but then you you understand it's exactly in that context that you're describing where there's that variation because allah is like the, the God in Islam. I don't know how to describe it on the, yeah, in, in the kind of li linguistic sense, but it completely mirrored what you were saying. Yeah, it's called a theo, I believe it's called a theonym. Theonym, so it's, okay. It's, yeah. a, it's the name. Allah hmm. is a theonym. It's the name of the God. It's a title. A theonym is a title, title that eventually becomes a name. Yeah. So Allah was a title, but Allah became the name because it's a nameless God. Allah is a nameless God. Why, why is he an, an anonymous God? So, so um, Lloyd, okay. sorry, this is just really random. Sorry, just sorry, quickly correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. I thought before we kind of got into all of this and when I, just my limited understanding of what the gods were at the time, I thought that the word Allah must have seeped in because that was the, the most prominent like uh, like deity in, in the hierarchy. And that's why Muhammad wanted to like say that, you know, we'll focus all of our attention now onto Allah as opposed to uh, Manat and Al-Uzza and all of that. But obviously now like we're uncovering, uncovering that even that backdates that and it, it's obviously like synonymous with sin and all these other things as you're saying anyway so is that considered to be the top of the pyramid of the pantheon so Allah, i believe so so the old gods so yeah i believe four layers of gods i believe there were four layers so you had the prime god on top allah right the moon god at least within the babylonian pantheon and the arabian pantheon in mm. the like greek roman pantheons the, the 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 moon god was female right whereas and the sun god was male in Egypt, the sun god was male, whereas in Arabia and Babylon, it was reversed. Yes, right, okay. Right. And then, of course, your secondary gods was his wife and their offspring, which are the stars. Yeah. Right? And don't forget, in Islam, the stars are higher beings that have souls. This is the Islamic belief. Oh, okay. The stars yeah, the, are higher beings that, that, that have souls. Wow. Yes. The stars are higher beings that have souls. And then you've got different levels. You've got like, you've got, so you've got the creator gods, then you've got their offspring. Then you have, I think, the, then you'll have like gods of the elements. I could be wrong here, but then the, something like gods of the elements. And then you have maker gods. The maker gods are the ones that like build the houses and the palaces and the swords and the chariots for the, for the main gods. 
Right. And then below that, you have minor gods, like minor maker gods, and uh, gods of like little areas, small geographical areas, gods of the spring, gods of this little clearing or something like that. You know? Okay. Yeah. So it gets more and more like kind of localized as you yeah. go down the chain. Okay. Right. Let's get cracking. Thank yeah. you, Louis. Um, just so, by the way, Allah, I did show this before, but Allah, actually, you'll find, uh, gosh, okay, hold on. I need to find this now. Yeah, uh, sure. Because, look, I, I'm no expert on this one. Again, I like to speak from knowledge. I don't like to, um, I'd rather have references in front of me. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just adding some mods on my channel while you do that. Ah, here we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, so did I, Lord. I literally thought stars, stars were missiles um, in my limited understanding. Wait, start it again. I do not hate when I do this to myself. We're getting we're getting a couple of spammers in the chat, but I have um, added some more mods. If you guys can just keep an eye on spammers, please. Um, just spammers and cat blocks. That's the only thing. Let me find this again and I will, you know, I'll, give me one. I'll get back to that in a minute. But basically, in, within the Greek, within the within the Strong's Dictionary, I have shown this in the, I have shown this previously, Allah is also defined as a curse. Okay. From the Hebrew, it's a curse. So I'll, I'll get to that later. Okay, sure. <clears throat> um. So hold on. Should I go to the part where the stars have souls? I think I, I mean, I'm definitely intrigued. I think D is even saying shooting stars were missiles. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought to obviously um, stop people from, you know, hearing <laughs> the, the, whatever was being said in heaven. And stationary stars were lamps is how the, it's okay, like so... described in the Quran as being decorated. But yeah, Lloyd, please so... enlighten us. Yes. So notice we spoke of the we spoke of the star god Athar. His name has come up numerous times in this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. As related to the Kaaba, as related to Muhammad, and so on, as as one of the gods of the pantheon of of Arabia. And notice they use the word in Islam as a relic of the Prophet, his hair, teeth, something that belonged to him. Okay, but in the science of the tradition, in astrology, in Islamic astrology, it is used as a technical term in the theory of causality, of causality. In other words, your life is influenced by the stars with reference to the influence of the stars on fate. And the stars are in Islam considered as higher beings possessing a soul. Wow. And on the terrestrial and, world and on men. Okay, yeah, so there's a direct influence that they have. Yeah. And this is related to the name of the star god, Atar. <laughs> We've discussed Atar quite often. Yeah. And you can go to volume one. This is the Islamic Encyclopedia, right? You said? Yeah, it's the Encyclopedia oh. of Islam. Yeah. Wow, wow, we, okay. I think I know why they put that price on this because they do not want people seeing this. Yeah, yeah, $40,000. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's insane. Uh, I wish I could afford to rent. Even if you rent it, it's like $5,000 a year or something, $6,000 a year. It's crazy stuff. Oh my gosh. You are, you have a treasure trove, Lloyd. Yeah. So, so thanks guys. So hopefully that was an interesting introduction and uh, useful to everyone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now Nabonidus, some people say Nabonidus. Now, mm -hmm. He was, so Nabonidus controlled this area. He was the last king of Babylon before they were defeated, right? So Nabonidus glorified Shin or Sin, right? His son, now this is not scholars. When they say son in this case, they don't take it literally. They've got some explanation. So, so don't take it necessarily. It was literally his son, but it's sure. considered his son. In that context, in that time, that's what they called it, right? Okay. So he was, his son apparently is Belshazzar, who's mentioned in the book of Daniel. This is the writing on the wall. Right, where Daniel has there's this writing on the wall, and then of course they, you know, the whole thing, um, he's the, the, their kingdom collapses the next day. They get invaded from Persia, I believe. So, so yeah, so he eventually invaded. So he eventually invaded, and he ended up taking over this area himself. So they controlled all of this, the whole Mesopotamian crescent, right, the fertile crescent, right. and he controlled the region all the way down to Medina. Right, so he worshipped Sin. Okay. Right? And he promoted sin. His all the way mother, down to modern day Medina, just to reiterate. Yeah, all the way yeah. down to modern okay. day Medina. And of course, then the Yemenis invaded 
who also worshipped sin, they invaded and they went all the way up this way. So they controlled the interior. So you had okay. from both sides. They, Double they whammy, invaded. yeah. Yeah. And so let me continue. So he lives 10 years in Tema, Saudi Arabia. Tema is also known as Yemen, oddly enough. Yemen. Very weird. Okay, wow. Yeah, very weird, huh? <laughs> Who would have thought, okay. Lloyd? So this is located in Arabia at the point of the trade route between Medina and the Duma across the Nefud Desert. So that's across this region here, right? This is, and this was 350K. So he lived in Tema, north of Yemen, and it was a center of moon worship. So he was a son-in-law of King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Now, when they say son-in-law, it doesn't mean he was literally a son-in-law, but mm. I, I, there's some, this is the historical title they give it, but whatever, okay? His mother was high priestess of Shin in Haran. This is, remember, where Abraham yeah. was living. Okay. Also known as Haran is also known as the city of the moon. Oh, right. Okay. His, his daughter was the head priestess of Sin at Ur. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. So you so, just, just so you said Haran is also known as the city of the moon? Yeah. Yeah. This okay. is in Turkey. This is where Abraham okay. supposedly was, right? Where he destroyed all the idols. Right. Mm. So. Now, we sp they speak of Abram's origin in Ur. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but obviously the Ur in Mesopotamia is sort of down, it's down here. Uh, no, so it's down here somewhere. Uh, sorry, here, I'm being slow. It's somewhere around here, but yeah. there's there's archaeological evidence. There are scholars that, that, so up until about 1939, scholars thought that based on the biblical evidence, based on all the knowledge of the day, that Ur was up north, close to where Haran is today. Right, because mm -hmm. there's at least five ancient cities, at least five, with names that are reminiscent of Ur, that are up here in the north. Okay, right. and then in 1938, a guy came along, an archaeologist with a lot of money and lots of great PR skills. He came along and he discovered the massive ziggurat of Ur, and suddenly that became the place where Abraham was. He wanted to find something that was worthy of Abraham, but there's no particular reason. There are there are there's dissenting views, and I personally, from what I've looked at, reading through the works that I've read through. I'm of the agreement that Abraham didn't go all the way up here, then come all the way down here. He actually started up here. Right. And there's various okay. reasons within the biblical. I'm not going to get into that in too much yeah. detail. Now, the word Yatrib for Medina appears in an inscription found in Haran, right, belonging to the Babylonian king Nabonidus. So clearly there's a connection between Haran in Turkey, where Abraham was, as well as Medina. Yatrib, yeah. Yatrib is the old name of Medina. Exactly. Notice there's all there's actually a place called Mecca in northern Iraq, oddly enough. Okay. Little, and is that an actual okay. city or is that a reference to like a There's a, a town north of, of Baghdad, I believe, called oh, okay. Mecca in, in northern Iraq as well. Oddly enough, and north of that is Medina. So <laughs> what? So so just a bit odd. So okay, yeah. so Nabonidus, he is like five fifty BC, last king of Babylon of the Sumerian Mesopotamian cultures, right? He's related to Nebuchadnezzar. He has a child mm -hmm. in Sabian Haran. Now, when they say Sabian, these are the Gnostic Sabians, what they call the Mandaeans today. So and this is a major site of worship for the moon god Sin. He was called the first archaeologist. I said I had to check this. Okay, I just saw that reference. I thought it was interesting. He rearranged the Babylonian pantheon of gods. He kicked Marduk out and he replaced okay. him with Sin. Okay. Okay. So this is him on an engraving in Saudi Arabia. This is him wearing a wizard's hat. Oh, okay, wow. with the wizard staff. Yeah. Okay. And you've got the moon. You have the sun god with wings, which is a very much an Egyptian idea. And you've got mm -hmm. the star god. This is Athar. Uh-huh. And wow. this is the Milky Way. The snake is the Milky Way, apparently. Oh, my gosh. Right? Okay. This is a rock engraving in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They haven't revealed much of it. There's more to it, but they haven't revealed much of it. Apparently, it's it's kept under wraps. It's quite secret. So, oh uh, yeah, I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> this alone, you know how uh, Lloyd a picture speaks a thousand words. Yep. So we'll continue. Then he lived in Tema for ten years in Saudi Arabia. Sin was the father of the gods and the god of wisdom, the Hikma, right? Worshipped in Iran until the arrival of Islam, right? And then crescent moon flags in the region are all traced to Sin. So even the crescent, I mean, look, there's, we're not supposed to believe our lying eyes when you see the crescent moon and star on top of the mosque. Yeah, exactly. Right. When all the flags are stars and crescents, we're not supposed to believe our lying eyes. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Norse mythology is right. Wahhabis would destroy it if they find it. Correct. Yeah. It's Indeed. Pre-Islamic. Pre yeah. And exactly this. 
correct. I'm, I'm honestly surprised, done. Lloyd. I genuinely didn't even know there were rock inscriptions as such. So even even this is a revelation to me. In Northern Arabia, there are rock inscriptions dedicated to Jesus. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. But something so of this. I mean, this century. is that this is literally like something. I mean, that wizard is so well. Done. How are you even going to try and deny that? It looks like something straight out of Harry Potter. Yeah, no. And also, oddly enough, there was a trinity of gods, okay? Mm -hmm. So they had a trinity, right? Um, so the winged feathered sun disk was Shamash, the god of justice and morality. And you had the seven-pointed, sometimes eight-pointed star, Ishtar, also known as goddess of sex, love, and war. She was a war god. But notice, in the Arabian pantheon, it became Atar, who was male, mm -hmm. right? Right, The gender okay. swapping again. Flipped, yeah. Also known as Venus, Aphrodite in the Greek-slash-Roman pantheon, right? Yeah and so on right and this is Nabonidus again and then Anunit just out of interest Anunit was an Assyrian or Chaldean goddess worshipper early mon monarchs she's also the Venus of the Greeks she was a star identified by the Assyrians with the goddess Ishtar the daughter of the moon god Sin so understand that all of these different cultures had the same god under a different name yeah precisely or basically the same god there's an account given by Nabonidus of his restoration of the temple of the moon god at Haran Okay? okay. And the god at Haran was Sin, the moon yeah. god. That's yeah. why I've been so. And you had the sun god and of Anunit. So you had the sun god as well, right? The female and mm. Anunit, their daughter, right? And Cyrus, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So now, oh, and by the way, we have Adram Malik. Malik comes back, Ma Moloch, Adram Malik. Okay. Right? Yeah. This right. idea of the Malik. Yeah. The king. Yeah. You explained that last time. Right. So now what's interesting is Tema's influence and sin, okay? Tema's position, probably forced, okay? So so Nabonidus being in Tema, he basically brought new culture to Arabia, right? Mm -hmm. And this may have forced or stimulated the other town states or city states of the o oases of Arabia to partake to some degree in the civilizations being forced upon them, this new, these new cultures that were coming, right? And however, according to the scholars that I'm reading, they also tried to preserve or reestablish their own independence. Okay. Right. So they tried to maintain their culture while also trying to absorb. So they kept on having to absorb new cultures, take on new ideas, right? There was this constant development. But notice here, different scripts are used and developed. Even the clansmen of the nomadic tribes knew how to write. That's Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 1, page 883. Now, I can go to a different source again completely where you can see 4th century inscriptions, which some of from a tribe that dates back to the to the fourth century B, no, the first millennium BC, up to a thousand BC, that had writing. They traveled all across Arabia. They had writing. Writing was common okay. in Arabia. And then when Islam yeah. came, everything disappeared. All the evidence gone. Yeah. No writing, no documents, everything missing somehow. And then the Hadith are written 150 years later, bang, suddenly all this writing comes back. Yeah, true, exactly. And obviously it starts off with an illiterate man who has no idea how to read or write, supposedly. So, so notice there are several important archaeological sites, okay, where, and this is about writing in that region, so there are surviving documents are written in Aramaic, right, language and script, or rather in various varieties. Aramaic was the mother tongue of part of the population, especially the elites, and a large number of Aramaic-speaking churchmen and religious authors in the Nestorian church came from the Gulf. There are texts in Sabaean, the Yemeni script, which are relatively common. In the Gulf, as in the north of the Ijaz, texts in foreign languages, Akkadian, Imperial Aramaic, Nabataean, Greek, and Latin are common. In southern Arabia, five inscriptions were found in Gez, which is the classical Ethiopic language, two in Hebrew, three in Sabaic, Nabataean, and Greek Latin, and one in Greek, one in Nabataean, and finally in Palmyrenian. And then there's graffiti in Greek, Nabataean, Palmyrenian, Indian, and Gez. So in other words, there was a profusion of languages across Arabia, and then Islam comes and suddenly nothing. Gone in a flash, yeah. It's like it's, it's just the, the, the slate's been wiped clean, and they, they start it all off. And, I mean, it starts off in the most... You know, like literally step by step writing on parchments and bits of animal They seem skin. to have obliterated all the evidence prior. And only now yeah. is archaeology starting to discover things that were covered by sand or things that were destroyed. But they're now starting to recover some of this. They're realizing there was a very literate civilization in that area at the time. But Islam somehow wiped it all out. They erased yeah. all the evidence. There was, even, uh, there was even language beyond that region, like text found of like foreign languages for that region itself. So to assume that there was absolutely no writing going on before Islam, it's just, I mean, the evidence flies in the face of that. Yeah, yeah, actually, hold on, I can show you. 
uh, this one, I, I just discovered this not that long ago. In fact, I think one of your contributors in the chat may have mentioned it. Um, this is the, so this one is the, so biblical archaeology. Um, I have a subscription to this website. Mm -hmm. And now these guys have articles from all sorts of authors. They collate articles from archaeologists in the region. Okay, so now this is, um, some of these archaeologists have their own agendas, their own axes to grind. So sometimes you've got to read between the lines. So some of them are Christians, some of them are not. Some of them clearly have an agenda. They dislike Christianity. So so the, you've got to sort of like, so they have these battles going on with these different scholars who have different warring opinions, right? Yeah. But this, this one goes back to the third, fourth century. And <clears throat> in fact, it even references Jesus. So you can see here, and what is odd is on this rock, Jesus in the Quran is called Isa, mm -hmm. which is correspond which corresponds to the divine name Isa here. So oh apparently, God, this okay. may be the earliest record of Isa being referenced by nomads who had written text in the fourth century. These guys were were able to write from BC already. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this was written so by Christians. These these had to have been Christians who wrote it. Wow, but okay. they, the format of the prayer that they discuss here is written the way that the pagans used to write. Mm -hmm. But they substitute. So basically, it's the culture was still very much in that sense pagan, and the, but the, so the format is like the way they would write. Uh, it says here, so um, yeah, that's what I was actually just yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a commemoration of a dead person, but it says here that it's Sapphiatic. But the old gods and prayers are replaced by a Christian invocation. So it's typical Sapphiatic. So the culture, okay. some of these had adopted Christianity, and now they were, they changed all that. But the style was still very much of the culture of the pagan culture. Okay, and yeah, they said they would they would say this to kind of conclude their prayer to invoke like the wise one or something. It just said it just mentioned it up above. It's a blessing on a dead it's relative, a bless and looking yeah. Jesus with the same structure. So yes, wow, so I just okay. thought that would be interesting. So this yeah. is very. Okay, so now in the earliest, in the earlier polytheistic period, Hadrami, this is the Yemeni pantheon, shows a close similarity to other South Arabian areas, dominated by the astral triad of Sun, Moon, and Venus. Except that the Moon god in Hadramot bore the distinctive name Shin, borrowed from Babylonian religion, and is commonly commonly referred to as Sin of Ilm, as he's been conjectured that the latter term is the name of the principal shrine of the deity. Okay, fine and well. So, as well as Arabian languages, a number of foreign tongues were in use in the land. There were Akkadian documents, Greek. And Greek texts in Bahrain, even there were even Greek and Latin wow. rock inscriptions, Aramaic language. Okay, and this is proven by a growing corpus of texts, coins, bronze plaques, and potsherds, surviving correspondence in Aramaic dialect known as Syriac between church authorities in Babylonia and East Arabia. Again, there was a multitude of writing, and where did it all go? Yeah, exactly. Where did it all go? If it's if it's to this extent, and there's a crossover, and there's these cultural exchanges, and all of a sudden, in a flash, we're told there was nothing there prior. Correct. So clearly, there was something, and it was all erased. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So Haran exists in Turkey today, right on top yes. of the ancient one. True, because nothing else is supposed to be in Arabia except Islam. Exactly. So near, so near Haran, have I, co I haven't covered these slides before. Right? This should be new. So yep. near Haran are villages that bear the names of Abraham's great-grandfather and his grandfather, Seruk and Nahor, from Genesis. Right. So Abraham is in Haran. Haran was the father of Lot, and the cities of Ur and Haran had the moon god as their main deity. And Terah was one of the names of the deity as well. This was actually the name of the deity as well. As well. Terah was one of his names, of al -Makka. Was the father of Abraham. He worshipped other gods, okay? And his family moved from Ur to Haran. Right. They even mentioned that in Haran, you're the traffickers of Sheba and Rama, and they were thy traffickers. And Haran and Kane and Eden, the traffickers of Sheba. So these people from Yemen were trading all the way up to Turkey. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so these so th this this shows, I mean, so there's a correspondence to the biblical narrative from the from the history that clearly something was going on. All right. And then and they mentioned here it seems to be of great importance for the cultural and religious development of the Arabs that Nabonidus conquered Tamar, and he made an expedi expedition as far as Medina, the mm -hmm. center of an archaeistic religion and cult around the Aramean moon god Sin. Again, moon god Sin. Perhaps with the sun disk resting in the crescent as the main symbol. There should be investigations on the close resemblance between this cult and that of the South Arabia and Ethiopia. Sin was the state god of Hadramot. This is part of Ker. 
since the earliest inscriptions of this state. So Sin was in Arabia. The Babylonian god Sin was part of this region. From This is getting earliest... so juicy now, Lord. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so then let's continue. Thank you. So from Terat to Amakka, so Elam, a name given to the moon god by the southern Hebrews, right? Variants of Elam were Era, Etera, and El Makkah. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jera, yeah. Shahar, and Tera. This is the name of Abraham's father. So yeah. Abraham's father was a worshiper of Al-Makkah. He was named after the god. Okay, okay, yeah. Then you have, oddly enough, you have Yam, the Babylonian sea god. Now, I know there's a man. I'm, can someone help me? Because I cannot find it. The Suf Al-Yom, I've heard this name. Al-Yom is supposed to be like the Red Sea or something like that. I know it means day, but there's another reference mm. to it. But Yom, the Babylonian sea god, was killed by Baal with two clubs fashioned by Qatar. Wahasis, called driver and expeller. Now, Qatar, now, if you, again, I've mentioned before, when you look up the etymology of the word Qatar for the country, Qatar, mm -hmm. you can't find it. The scholars will tell you, well, we don't really know. We think it means sea. It could well mean ocean. It could mean plentiful, bountiful. But notice that Yom, the Babylonian sea god, was killed by Baal with two clubs fashioned by the maker god, Qatar. Okay. That's the, that's the seems to be the that may well be the origin of the name of the country Qatar. It's oh my named god! After, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It's named after go a on, god, a pagan god. And in your personal opinion, do you think that that could be the case? For now, I I'm annoyed with myself because I found another reference to a god called Qatar, mm -hmm. also in reference which talked about this another god called Qatar which could be linked to what we call Qatar today. And I cannot find that reference. So I found a second one, but I can't find it again. So, yeah. but the linguistic similarity, I mean, it's just a little odd. It, it most definitely is odd. And I didn't realize that they even um, kind of like would backtrack from answering that question about the derivation of Qatar today. No one trying so to find the derivation that. of Qatar. Okay, yeah, yeah, guys, let's try. I'm going to definitely try it after this stream. It's a shame I can't do it right now, but... I think, yeah, Lloyd, you're blowing our minds, right? Let me just, I need to, that's crazy if that's the case. And you don't understand so, why, right? They're, they're, they can't, they, they know. So that means they, they know on a level that this stuff is, it, it's too detrimental to what, to like, as people say, without lies, Islam dies. And they've got to maintain it. You've got to do whatever you can. I think on some level, the scholars are aware. Now, Tara means ibex, which in ancient times was a well-known moon symbol on account of the ibex's curved horns. Okay, so a scholar, well-known scholar, Egit and Sykes, wrote that Terra was a theophoric name, Terra, ancient Semitic name for the moon, equated with Terra, father of Abraham. The moon was also known as Etera and Jera. al Makkah mm. is called the master of the ibex or the lord of the ibexes, and Terra means ibex. Okay. So the moon god al Makkah is known as the master of the ibex. That was one of his formal names. Yeah. And Abraham's father is named after the moon god al Makkah. <laughs> Right, yeah. one of, just like Elias, 99 names, looks like Al-Makkah also had 99 names. Yeah, exactly. Abraham's younger brother was named after the city Haran, which was the city of the moon. So the name Haran seems to have become a theophoric name synonymous with the moon god Sin. The temple of Bilkis, queen of Sheba, was a moon god temple, which misled the Arabs to think that Solomon's god Yahweh must be a moon god. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hold on. I need, I need a minute to digest that last line as well, because this is now, this is what I had like massive issues with as a Muslim trying to understand in the Quran. But if we look at it from this angle, the temple of Bilqis, the queen of Sheba, who's mentioned herself in the Quran as Bilqis was in fact, potentially a moon God temple, which then misled the Arabs to think that Solomon's God Yahweh must be a moon God. That Same is, as their God. Yeah, right. Okay, just by virtue of that temple. Yeah, so we've spoken about the temple at Sawan. Remember the, the very first temples we discussed? You had the mm -hmm. one in Ethiopia, and then you had three more on the other side. One of yeah. those was dedicated expressly to Yilkis, right? But they were all moon god temples dedicated to al Makkah. She mm -hmm. worshipped al Makkah. Wow, okay, yeah. And obviously, so did Abraham's father being named after it. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. And yeah, so and okay, you can find this again, guys. This is in that that the collection I showed you, City of the Moon God, religious and traditions, religious traditions of Haran by uh, uh, something green, 
Tamara Green. You know, it's in the, guys, it's there. It's from Brill, one of the, this is the oldest academic publisher in the world, I believe, like 300 and something years old. So by all means, download it, read it for yourself. I didn't write it. Okay. So then you've got here, so the, the Sabians of Haran and the classical tradition. Now you've got David Pinger, another article. They speak of, so um, to simplify, the Sabians, now these are the, the Mandaeans today. They were Gnostics, mm -hmm. pseudo-Gnostics, whatever, right? They used Neoplatonism. Now, that's a long story to get into. I'm not going to do it now. Yeah. yeah. But their interest was in Greek astronomy and astrology and astral magic, right? And the Greek philosophical, now notice the Sabians. Now, I, I remember I mentioned that comment to you that the, the Sabians mentioned, that the Sabians are mentioned in the, uh, in the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. But the Quran doesn't, and the Islamic scriptures don't properly distinguish between the Sabians and the Sabaeans, the Gnostic Sabians from the north, the Sabaeans, the Yemeni moon god worshippers from the south, and a third group that took the name Sabians to become people of the book so they wouldn't be killed. Mm -hmm. the, these yeah. guys were apparently polytheists. So they, they they just took the name and they said, okay, well, hey, we're Sabians today. Yeah, and exactly. Because even in the Quran and the Hadith, it comes up in that in that one way, like that one word to describe whichever people they're referring to at the time. Yeah, okay. and it's three so, groups. Now, now yeah. which one? It kind of gets confusing. <laughs> and the problem is that in the Hadith, you'll see Muhammad is described as a Sabi, which is a contraction. Mm -hmm. Now, when they say he's a Sabi, are they talking about he's a Yemeni Sabi or he's a Turkish Yemeni? I mean, Tur Har Haranian Sabi. Mm -hmm. Which one? It's it's vague, unfortunately. So now, so it could be that he was a Yemeni pagan worshiper. Then he became a Gnostic, right? And then to branch and deviate, he deviated to to distinguish an, his own identity. He then could have formed Islam later as a separate identity. Yeah, yeah. So he's kind of like obviously built on it, built on both of those, and then obviously formed Islam. That that that's basically where I'm at in terms of trying to see how this path unfolds based on what we've talked about so far. Yeah. So so now notice, now these Sabians in Haran, the following, there's the Greek philosophical and scientific material available to them was mingled with elements from ancient Mesopotamia, from India, Iran, Judaism, and Egypt to form a syncretic system of belief. That's, a, that's basically a soup that they could claim to be mankind's original and authentic religion. Wow. So, Lloyd, even there, first of all, the Im implication that this is going to be the original and authentic, same same implications that uh, Islam says, okay, even if Islam doesn't claim that the complete original, they say we're the completion of the Abrahamic faiths, but they do, con they do claim to be the authentic and correct and eternal, timeless, final message. But already yeah. when we're discussing the Sabians here, um, this is already... Uh, a soup, as you're saying, to begin with. This is already a medley and a mishmash of all of these places and these beliefs. So you've already got this concoction that we're seeing, right? Which is obviously why you're, we're seeing all these parallels according to like different geographical locations spill over. And as you're saying, they kept constantly adopting the culture, but then also trying to have their own. And I think that claim there to be original and authentic is them trying to leave their individual mark on it. Well, remember I mentioned earlier within the Sira that there were these four followers of Muhammad that went north, south, east, and west to look for the original religion of Abraham, mm. right? And the original religion of Abraham, Abraham was originally a Sabaean, right? Like the mm. Yemenis. He was a, was a worshiper of upright pillars, yeah. right? He was a moon god worshiper, right? Now they go to Haran and they find the Sabians who also claim to be mankind's original and authentic religion. And these guys basically are a mishmash of everything, but they're known as Gnostics. Okay. And Islam, if you look at Islam's stories, there's, there's a huge Gnostic influence. I showed you yeah. in the Sharia that Islam claims in the Sharia to be a Gnostic religion. And then the stories of, of Jesus are all Gnostic stories. All of mm -hmm. you know, all of these, these stories, there's so many Gnostics, dozens of Gnostic tales in the Islamic literature. Yeah. So now it looks like they've now glommed onto these guys, first from the Yemenis and now from the Iranians in Turkey. Uh -huh. And sorry, wasn't, uh, was what's his name, Nofal bin... What was his name again? Warak ibn Nafal. Warak ibn Nafal, exactly. Wasn't he claimed to be a Gnostic in himself? Like, uh, I mean. That's or, a question because he's both his first name and his surname apparently are both pagan because his father was pagan. Right. right? Okay. Right. So Warak is, I think, the name of a, of a pagan god. And then Nafal is, there's another relationship there, but, but, hmm. but there's a pagan lineage then. And he apparently is 
I think he's supposedly an historian or something like that. Okay, yes, yeah, I've heard similar things. So I don't know if he's made up, is he a legend, how much of it's embellishment? These are all questions. I it's hard to tell. <laughs> so yeah, then Strong's okay, briefly I'm gonna run through this real fast. So if we go to Strong's H Hebrew 410, you have El, ancient Semitic term for deity from Assyrian Elu and Ugarit El, generic word for God in the Semitic languages, just like Allah, the God, right? Mm -hmm. El. Okay, it's used over 200 times in the Old Testament, often as a modifying term with it. El was the chief and somewhat vague, shadowy god of the Canaanite pantheon. Okay, and the title is used in the Old Testament to express, again, in contrast, the exalted transcendence of the Hebrew god, right, of the biblical god. Yes. Now, the Hebrews took the word El, basically they, they reclaimed it. They said, yeah. no, your god is not El, our god is El. The Hebrews borrowed this word from the Canaanites, and the linguistic derivation of the name is uncertain. Suggestions include roots that mean to be strong and to lead, right? The Canaanite god El was the father of human beings and of gods, called the father of mankind and the father of years. He was an immoral and debased character, however. So now, according to this, this, uh, this note, the notes I've heard, it's a tribute to the high morality of the Old Testament understanding of God that a title that in Canaanite usage was so defiled of a God of no virtue, of no morals, could without risk be used to express the moral majesty of the God of Israel. They claimed it and said, no, our God is the true God. He's the true moral God. Your God is debased. We're taking back that title. Yeah, so right? forget about your immoral debate. We'll apply that to that, that title to our real moral yeah. God, the God of gods, yeah. yeah. So just as the word God in English can be used of the true God or of false gods, so this word in Hebrew may refer to heathen gods, usually meaning idols. Right. Okay, so notice in Strong's, the, the term El also refers to the Sabaeans used it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Assyrians used it, the Nabataeans used it, again, the Sabaeans used it, the Palmyrenians, the Phoenicians. And then in the Syrians, you had Alatu. In the Syriac, you had it as well. So understand, there's all these little con these connections to all these different cultures that, you know, um, that were all, they were all competing for, obviously, the, the, the god, the name. They all wanted the name, right, to ascribe mm -hmm. it to their deity. But Alatu, again, you've got Alat. So she was seemed to be, Alat may well have been the Allah of the pantheon of Arabia. Right, okay. So the fact that you've got Alat here may well yeah. have been, and don't forget, she was the major god of the Nabataean pantheon. Yeah, Okay. And wow. Muhammad worshipped Alat, Manat, and al -Uzza. Yeah. Right? And here you can see different variations of, you've got Baal, Baalim, Baal, Baal, Hal El. Remember, there was Kal. We had the Yemenis who invaded Arabia that took over Arabia. Their god was called Kal, mm. derivative of Kael from the Hebrew Kael. Wow, okay. So, right. And so now let's look at Baal and Aterat in the Bible. So in Israelite religion, Yahweh replaced the great god El as Israel's god. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So in Judges 3, 7, we read that during Joshua's time, the Israelites did what was offensive to Yahweh. They ignored Yahweh, their god, and they worshipped Baalim, plural of Baal, and they worshipped Asherat or Atarat, the plural of <laughs> Asherah. Okay, so now we're back to Atar, Atarat, right? So... The prophet Elijah asked King Ahab to, okay, so short, I'm just going to shorten this. So basically, there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, okay? So Baal had his female consort called Baala. Okay. The I did not, Baal. yeah, okay. Yeah, she was quite, she had a lot of prophets that and servants. So yeah, Baala, so Baal and Baala. Baala, Baala. that Baala, yeah. Oh my word! Okay, because I mean, you can see how you would derive Allah sooner or not, sooner or later from Bala. <laughs> if exactly, if you want to kind of, and if you want to combine the powers of both, well, you smoosh them together. You make a soup, which exactly. is remember what what we discussed previously, I believe. So, so yeah, so Asherah is associated with Baal during the religious reform of King Josiah, when Josiah ordered the objects made for Baal and Asherah removed from the temple and burned. So according to the the according to the, the Bible, of course, these were offensive to God. They needed to be destroyed, mm. right? But of course, basically, Muhammad would have wanted to keep them and bring them back, I guess. Yeah. So, okay, so let's continue. Now, the Kinda. Now, the Kinda are from Yemen. So the Kinda were down here. Again, you've got the same region, Yemen, that, that keeps coming up. These guys took over at least this area, if not all the way up into Palestine, what they call Palestine here. Okay. So these guys right. may have controlled, at a minimum, they controlled this region, if not all the way up to here. Yeah. These wow. are Yemenis okay. from down here. Mm -hmm. These are sin worshippers again. 
right? So Muslim sources agree that Hadramaut was the original homeland of the tribe of Kinda, nomadic people, which founded the Central Arabian Kingdom of Kinda, the Kindat al Muluk, the Kingdom of Kinda, the, Kinda, the, the kin, Kingdom of Moluk. Yeah, the Kingdom of the King. Yeah. So notice they they, it's, they said they may have controlled the totality of Inner Arabia up to the low, lower Iraq as well as. So these guys had huge, these Yemenis wow, had huge influence. That they is went a all vast, the way up into Mesopotamia. Yeah, precisely. That's a vast amount of land to be in charge of. Yep. So, so it's these so guys. Weird, you know, like obviously, I don't, I don't know how much work has been done into this empire at this time exactly, or like the level of control, but it, it's mental when you think about it. So, and we've never heard of these places. Now, their no, capital. We haven't. It's so their capital was, uh, so, uh, let's see if it will find this. Here we go. Let's go to their capital. So their capital was right there. This is Mecca, and this was mm -hmm. the capital of the Kinda Kingdom right here. It still stands today. Wow, Okay. Could, okay. could we and zoom in? Named, just, yeah, 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 just a little bit. Okay. It still stands today. Wow. Okay. So this was their capital. Yeah. So this was their capital. They invaded mm -hmm. up here, and so they controlled all of this region, possibly all the way up to the coast. Wow. Right. Flippinac. And this is named after their moon god again. So this is named after their god. The gods they worshipped include Kal, Kael, as well as Atar al Sharik, and a god called La. <laughs> There we go. Pieces of the puzzle. So their god is called La. So now you've got this Atar again and La, right? Sharik means rising from the east or companion or partner. It's a reference to the sun, right? Mm -hmm. So now South Arabian inscriptions from the 4th to 5th century AD refer to a god called Rahman. I believe we've discussed this, but we, we know we skipped around with a few things. But Rahman is the merciful one who had a monotheistic cult and was referred to as the Lord of Heaven and Earth fine and well. Aaron Hughes states that scholars aren't sure whether he developed from the earlier polytheistic systems or he developed due to the increasing significance of the Christian and Jewish communities. Now, I have mentioned, and I will cover this now again, so Rahman is very important. Rahman bin Muhammad. Okay, so the upper classes, your elite, they went over to some form of monotheistic creed. So looking at the fourth century, roughly, Christianity was now present in Arabia. So there was a monotheistic creed, a cult of the merciful Rahman or Rahmanan, right? The Lord of Heaven, which is best described, which is best described as Hanifite. Remember, we spoke of the Hanifs, the original religion of Abraham. So this is not Christianity the way we'd know it, right? These guys were pagan. This is a syncretism of paganism and Christian beliefs. So yeah. they had a monotheistic God, but they were Hanifites, the religion of Abraham. We discussed this at length in the previous one. How important yeah. this word Hanif is, the Hanifs, right? So, so basically. Right, you've got a Jewish presence, you've got a Christian presence that goes way back, and we know the Christian presence goes back to the second, third century already. Now, notice mm -hmm. in this here, Quran fifty three forty nine calls God the Lord of Sirius. Right, the South Arabian deity Wad is mentioned in the Quran, but also notice that Sin, Sirius is the son of the moon god Sin. So the the star Sirius is the son of the moon god Sin. Mm -hmm. So if Allah is the Lord of Sirius, then Allah is Sin. Quite yeah, quite exactly. I mean, it just follows. Right. And then you've got inscriptions that date to the fourth century, right? There's a new monotheistic God. This is after the, after the debut of Christianity in the region. A new monotheist God called Rahmanan arrives on the scene, right? Which mm -hmm. was a Hanafite religion. So now you've got, this is a, not Christianity. that They've got Rahmanan, but it's Hanafite. Right, which was Yemeni paganism, right? So now they've got this blend. It was South Arabian, and he was described as the Lord of Heaven and Earth. The Quranic name Al Rahman is probably related to that. And one interesting inscription ends after mentioning Rahmanan with the phrase Rabhat bin Muhammad, which is translated as by the Lord of the Jews, by the highly praised. Wow. Okay, this is this is insanely meaty because we so we talked about how. Muhammad, or like the root Muhammad or Muhammad, whatever, literally means like the praised one or the highly praised itself. So, um, but it's also really interesting for the, in the sense that the very first inscriptions that even from the standard narrative we're told as well, the very first things you hear from Islamic perspective are 
Bismillah or Rahman Rahim. Like Rahman Rahim is always the very first like sightings or evidence of Islam coming into fruition. And so that's that's literally the the importation of this this new South Arabian deity that was already there, and then the name had manifested. So words like Rahman, Muhammad or Muhammad or that root, they're already knocking mm -hmm. about way before. Yes, 300 years before Muhammad. Yeah. Three, 350 years before Muhammad. <laughs> and notice, this is the Lord of the Jews. This is the God of the Bible. Yeah, exactly. It precisely, Muhammad yeah. Muhammad is in this case the Lord of the, of the, of the Jews, the God of the Jews. Yeah. This is Yahweh. Uh, Muhammad in that sense is just to, to refer to a, a an attribute towards right. the Lord of the Jews, yeah. But it may also be Jesus. Now let's continue here because yes, we've covered you this. It. Yeah, we've covered this. Now you've got another inscription which ends with the invocation in the name of Rahmanan. See here. Mm -hmm. Now the Christians will use it, and of his son, the conquering Christ. Okay. And you've got, okay, Rahman, Christos. You can see here, Christos. Mm -hmm. And this is Abraha. This is the guy with the elephants that invaded Mecca with the white elephant called Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> with the elephant Abraha's inscription yeah. contains equally clear formulas which begin with the power the help and the mercy of Rahmanan and of his messiah and of his holy spirit so oh in this my case, god because I just read that and in my head I just think literally Bismillah Rahman Rahim <laughs> in such yes. a similar fashion so Rahman was originally it seems Rahman was God Rahman had his son and the Holy Spirit, and then these guys took it over and they made it into, they corrupted it, basically. They made it into their Hanafite. They, they made it syncretic, right? They mixed their paganism with it. But the original reference would seem to be to that this was Jesus and God. And yeah. so this, and then Muhammad became, well, Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Jesus basically becomes Muhammad or God becomes Muhammad in the Islamic retelling. Yeah, I mean, that that's literally what it looks like from here, for sure. And I just wanted to say, um, Eero Monzele, sorry if I've said that wrong, but um, Eero Monzele is asking, do you know the root meaning, meaning of Rahman? But I think we, we literally just discussed here, right, that Rahman was actually for the God. Um, yeah, hold on, actually, we can have a look. Let's see, but um, we can have a look in the encyclopedia, for instance. I mean, okay, but, uh... sure. Lloyd, can I leave you for one second? I just have to grab my charger. Sure, sure. I'll be back in one second. No problem. Yeah, you do that. Actually, let's have a look and see what Rahman says. I can't, I can't remember offhand. There's so many things I need to try and keep in my head. Uh, Rahman, let's have a look. Let's see what the encyclopedia tells us. Keeps jumping back. So let me get on to R. Yeah, I can't remember it often, and I would prefer to look it up in a reference. So let me continue going here. You know, if it doesn't appear, that's very, very interesting, Rahman. Very interesting. It's not appearing here. Rahma. Hmm, interesting. So let me have a look here within. I want to go back to the Encyclopedia of Islam to write volume, see if we can find it up here.
Rahman. Let's see. And Rahman. Interesting. See Basmala, Quran. That's very interesting. Okay, see Basmala. That's very, very odd that it doesn't want to tackle that issue. So let's go back here. Let's take that word. Let's go to this one again. Hi, Rahim, yeah. yeah, North mythology. Very interesting thinking. that this thing doesn't want to. And actually, the encyclopedia takes us to, this is the formula for the Tasmia, but again, it tells us now to go to volume one, page 1084, volume three, and volume five. So, yeah. But look, Rahman is supposed to be the merciful. It's supposed mm -hmm, to be the, exactly. the merciful Rahman. Now. That's, yeah. I know, I just we just covered that, but I was hoping yeah. to see if there's something else more significant than that. But Rahman was originally just the merciful. Mm -hmm. right. And Benjamin, and, sorry, uh, Lloyd is asking, would you could you post this PDF so that we could they can search through it? It should be in the description box, right? Yeah, it should be it in the is. description it box. Should be me, in there. So let me actually send the link to the Google Drive. I'll drop that link again. Yeah, everything so we covered it, today, guys, will be there in the description of the video. If you click on this video, um, just like click on the arrow below it, you'll see the whole file where you can go I to just this Google Drive. The link there. Yeah, oh, for some reason. You. So. Yeah, it's a bit of a distraction for me to to look for it right now. No, 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 please don't carry on. Yeah. Okay. Right. So anyway, so yeah, so that's Rahman. So let's continue. Molik. Yeah, we have covered Molik. We kind of skipped mm -hmm. ahead, but you have Malik, Abdul Malik, title, not a name, right? You'd have Abdul Malik Marwan, Abdul Malik Lloyd, Abdul Malik John, right? Abdul mm -hmm. Malik Sally, right? Derived from the follower of Baal. Okay. Servant of or slave of Baal, the Karabal, because the Yemeni term, the Karib, the Muqarabs, we mentioned the Muqarabs before, right? The Yemeni term, the Karibs or the Muqarabs, the ones who were the followers of Baal, was replaced by the term Abdul Malik. This <laughs> is the older title. This becomes the newer title. The Karib Baal was the servant of Baal, the slave of Baal, right? Now, if you are the king, then you are the slave of the god Baal, right? So the name derives from the Hebrew constant, from the Hebrew term Melek, with the vowels of Boshet, shame. But there's another term, not just shame, and actually there's another word as well that the Hebrew uses. So malik, so the Arabic term malik is derived from melek, Hebrew king, and shame. So basically a king that is um, an abomination, a king that is an abomination, a king that is shameful, a king that is immoral. Okay. That's where that term comes from. Okay. And he has a bull head, and the, the, the bull was the symbol of al-Makkah, the symbol yeah. of the moon god. Right. And Moloch may be the same God as blah, 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 an epithet for Baal. And of course, it's one of Allah's 99 names, or Malik. Malik al Mulk, sure. Yeah. Right. King of the kingdom, and, Lord of the Lords. Yeah. Well, don't remember. So you had the Kindat al Malik, the, you know, as well. Yeah, precisely. So, Right. So notice that within the biblical text, you've got Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. Midian was, uh, let's see, Midian is up here. Okay. So, so Midian is right over here. This is this region here, just below Petra. Okay. So just here. So that's wow. this area around there. And they had crescent ornaments on the necks of their camels, right? They were the enemies of the Jews. They were enemies of the people of who worshipped Yahweh. And they had crescents on their camels okay now there there are stories that the midians are, is it a land is it a place or was it a tribal league because remember the mukarib was a was a federator a unifier he was a priest warrior king mm -hmm. right so he was like the the prophet warrior king if you will and muhammad was a prophet warrior king yeah indeed he was exactly and he was a federator he joined all the tribes and this so the question is was midian a land or a tribal league there's a question within the scholarship so the suggestion the name midian does not refer to geographical places but to a confederational league of tribes brought together as a collective for worship wow right? the suggestion was for yeah so you have a cultic collective and a, re a religious collective okay yeah. and so yeah and then of course they're thought to have worshipped the multitude including baal and the queen of heaven ashtaroth and of course, you had the king of heaven. So that's Athara again, just the female version of it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Then you have enemies of Yahweh. So in Psalms 83 4, we have, they said, Come and let us wipe out, this is the Israelis, as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. So even back in history, these guys were enemies of Israel. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb and all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us possess for ourselves the pastures of God. They wanted to take over that land mm -hmm. and the title. They wanted to be the people of God. So, yeah. so this religious 
fight has been going on since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. So they've just been battling it out to be the people of God from time of time immemorial, as you said. Yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah this so exactly. Media. We're seeing the recurring theme of this currently as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so that continues. And then so they'll borrow the name of Yahweh. So this is Arabian Ethiopia by CJ Robin in the Oxford Handbook of Late Antiquity. It's in the mm -hmm. folder, guys. The second question concerns the nature of Allah. Okay. Was he the God of the supporters of monotheism or a God of pagan origin? In the oldest revelations of the Quran, the name of Allah does not appear. So in the oldest versions of the Quran, in the earlier chapters of the Quran, there's no Allah. When Muhammad refers to God, he says the Lord. And if Muhammad wanted to give him a proper name, he didn't use Allah, he used Ar-Rahman. Yes, he does, was, exactly. Which was at the time the name of the one God of the Jews and the Christians of Arabia, because the Jews and the Christians were using Ar-Rahman. And then after they used it, a third group, a second group comes along, these pagans, these Hanifs, and they steal the name. And don't forget, there was the prophet, another fake prophet, like Muhammad, a guy called, uh, oh, good grief, I can't remember his name now, Musaylama, here. So there was a there was a guy competing with Muhammad called Musaylama, right? He was also making revela having revelations and blah blah blah. Muhammad had him killed, right? Because he was a competitor. He yeah. also called his god Ar Rahman, and he also had a monotheistic god called Ar Rahman. So the wow. Christians come along, and then a couple of other groups steal the name, and then Muhammad takes the name. Yeah. Right. So Allah is thus a god originating in polytheism. Inscriptions seem to confer it that Qariyat al-Fal, this is the Kinda capital, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned the capital of a Kinda, which is the one down here. When these Yemeni guys invaded all the way up to here, right? They eventually settled here that that's their capital, Qariyat al-Fal, right? For example, they mentioned the eagle entrusted tomb is built to call Allah. So the term Allah was going around way before Muhammad, wow, okay, as yeah. the main god. Yeah. And they also had Atar, again, the star god. And this, the text is dated by the writing style to the beginning of the Christian era. Oh, so my gosh. Clearly, okay. clearly yeah. They, these, these were not new terms. This was not an original idea. This was not a consolidation of the previous Abrahamic faiths, if that, like, the way Islam claims it to be at all. But I also, like, just want to remind people of that point that you mentioned, where, whether it was... Um, like a league of almost like unifying tribes for the purpose of worship and religion, which also lends so much credence to this because Muhammad got rid of Musaylama, who was directly his competitor, kind of using the same God's name and probably in a very similar way that Muhammad, you know, thought he's obviously a direct threat to Muhammad's message. Um, but this this whole concept of unification of Arab tribes and and this ummah, the concept of like a brotherhood of Muslims and that it, you see it manifest throughout Islam in general. So the league um, aspect of this, the combination, the culmination of tribes to this one unified way of worship seems very, also like very interesting and very plausible to me. So there's a political movement afoot as well as a religious Precisely. movement. Precisely. So, yeah. yeah. So let's look at some pre-Islamic Arabian deities. You had Astarte, a warrior goddess of Canaan and Syria, counterpart of the Akkadian Ishtar, worshipped in Mesopotamia. Her aggression can be seen in the bull horns she wears as a symbol of domination. Astarte is a battlefield goddess. Right, so the moon gods and these star gods are all all warrior gods and warrior goddesses. Right, the moon god was a warrior god. So Hilal is a god of the new moon. Am is the god of the moon god of Katavan from Yemen. He has the goddess Aterat as his consort. Okay, Allah had a lot. Deuteroscopy. Oh man, I, I saw that on um, the Boom Boom Room. It was hysterically funny. Deuteronomy. Uh, Muhammad <laughs> didn't say Deuteronomy. He said Deuteroscopy. So. <laughs> So Deuteroscopy That's 12 funny. has Yahweh mm. commanding the destruction of all the, th the shrines. So notice she's got male and female names here, right? Yeah. So the prophets of Israel warned God's people not to worship these gods. So biblically, they said, look, look, we, we reject these gods, right? Mm. But Kal or Hal is the moon god of the Yemen, of the Kinda, right? So now you've got Kael. So basically, they've taken the Jewish god, possibly, Kal, mm -hmm. Kael, Yahweh, and they've now appropriated it. Right. Yeah. So Sin was the chief god of the Hadramites. Also, guess where in Yemen, connected to the Semitic god Sin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Talab, a moon god worshipped by the Sume, a Sabaean tribal confederation, also from Yemen. Right. And then now, what's odd? Now we get a couple of strange gods. You have Yata. Okay. Now Yata 
is associated with salvation. Okay, his name means savior. Right. Right. It may be an archaic equivalent to Yeshua or Yeshua. You understand? Uh, yes. Yes. The masculine noun meaning salvation, like, yeah. taken mm -hmm. from the root Yesha, Isa, Yesha. Yeah. This is a bit of an yeah. oddity. Salvation. Exactly. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then you have Dul Khalasa, a God worshipped by blah blah blah, and he was worshipped as a God of redemption. Okay, so the, the Redeemer, the Savior, mm. right? His temple became known as the Kaaba of Yemen. And we have the Yemeni corner Hadith, where if you touch that corner, your sins are forgiven. Yes, precisely. And there is so much importance given to this Yemeni corner in Islam. So much. Yeah, so it's just all these little oddities, right? These little odd connections. And already you've got Muhammad, who was like, you know, God or Jesus, and just all these weirdness. And of course, mm. you had Al-Makkah, another of their gods, right? But yeah. now let's look at Yatha, also known as Yasha, also known as Yashu, Yeshua, Ishu, and Isa, right? So Yatha, Arabic, Savior, a pre-Islamic god worshipped by the Sabaeans and the Himyarites of Yemen. Nine kings had a theophoric name prefixed by Yatha. The name is an archaic equivalent to Yasha, which is a masculine noun meaning salvation from the Hebrew. So it's a Hebrew term, right? Yeah. Savior god, a Himyaritic deity to whom in conjunction with the other local gods, a temple was erected, Okay. And he was the special god in the town of Aden. And his analog was the Chaldean divinity, Salman, Salam, Islam. The same root as Islam. Islam. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. I understand. This, so it's... Yeah, this is... I mean, this has taken a, a <laughs> twist for me now. And this but, is... Chaldean is, is Mesopotamian. Yeah, exactly. And 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 so, Lord, it is, it, that's not a jump, right? To say that that's the root of Salman there is Salam, and like that that you wouldn't say that that's too much of a leap to make there. I mean, sometimes you'd have, I'd say it's fan. We can look. We 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 could look that up, but the but the root is there. S L M. Yeah, Salman. the root is most definitely there. Yeah. Right, because with some words you had a four letter root and some a three letter root, right? Like mm -hmm. Rahmanan just became Rahman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? precisely. Yeah. Okay, but Salim's got the got it's got the initial root Salim yeah. in it. So and these are usually three letter, three worded letter roots. When you see like you, even the way Arabic developed starts like this. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, it's just it's just these little connections that may or may not be important, you know. But it's mm -hmm. just there's so many coincidences, you know. Just what point, you know, do their coincidences stop? Now notice, there's the scholar called Ibn Al Jabbar, okay, very famous Islamic scholar. He says that Ishu refers to Jesus, right? That he so he uses the word Ishu based on the East Syriac form of Jesus, okay, Isho. Mm -hmm. And Abdul Jabbar says that Ishu is Syriac for Isa, the Quranic form of Jesus, okay. But we've just seen a rock inscription that says otherwise. And I've got another source that talks about an Ethiopic derivative. Okay. Yeah, I've got another source that talks about an Ethiopic derivative as well for, for where the term Isa comes from. But the earliest that I can find. Maybe, I don't know, so so there's, you saw the rock inscription and the Ethiopic, those two are, are the earliest. Okay. So, right, and then of course, uh, okay, so I'll skip all this, that's not that critical. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to skip this again, so the occults of Yahweh, um, okay, I'll skip this, not that important. Notice this table of planetary deities found in the Middle East, okay? You had, mm -hmm. so Sun, Moon, Mercury, and Venus, Roman, Greek, Arabian, they all had the same gods, Allah, Shams. Allah Ta'ala, we still have that, who was yeah. known as sin back in the day. Yeah. Right, wow. the most high God. That's crazy because in, in Urdu, we still, when we talk about God, we still say Allah Ta'ala. Yeah, so mm. it's, it goes way back. You have, wow. okay, and Venus was Uzza, and then you've got Babylonian, you've got the same names, Shin, Shin, Nana, Sin. And it, so, yeah, they, these these are not new gods. They, they're all part of the, they're all taking from each other. They were just all copying each other basically so it seems mm -hmm. right and then so arabian moon gods of war so the moon gods were war gods the moon gods allah am alumku mahram al maka osiris okay sin shin wad yara they were all the same basically the same god same characteristics and war gods there were moon worship centers in ethiopia haran okay marib yemen and of course there was a dam in yemen a very big dam that 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 split that burst and the Yemenis were forced to evacuate, and that's why they went north. Okay. And they took their religion with them. Tema as well. So you had Tema where Nabonidus was, right? And then you've got 
Okay, so now you've got this war god. Allah is the war god. Jihad is one of his one of his duties, right? So yeah. Hans Kraus, another scholar, says the main god, the national god of war, in all the South Arabian, okay, monuments, in almost all the Semitic monuments, the moon god was a war god. The moon that god was a war so god. Much. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, and the Abyssinian war and moon god was Mahrem, also known as Al Makkah. Uncanny. They also called him Al Makkah. Yeah. Same gods, same names, just. Then first and second century, a Sabaean plaque of Al Makkah. So now you've got a Sabaean plaque mm. and you've got a pair of sphinxes. Again, so Egypt pops in. It looks like they all somehow end up going back to Egypt somewhere. Yeah. And then you've got the tree of life and you're framed by a pair of date palms in full fruit, decorated borders. And it's dedication to Al Makkah of Hiran. Now notice Hiran. Do they mean Haran in Turkey? Mm, exactly. <laughs> okay. And yeah, so it's just really odd. And then now, Reading about the Sabaean moon and war god Al-Makkah, mm. okay, from temple inscriptions is enlightening about Al-Makkah's successor, Allah. Okay, for instance, there's a 250 AD inscription that reads, as for the servant Kalkab, he has thanked the power and the glory of Al-Makkah, the bull, because he has granted him to remain safe and unscathed in all those campaigns and battles. He has granted him to return with honor and with spoils of 32 slaughtered enemies and with booty, which has delighted his heart. Did Muhammad collect booty and spoils of war? Indeed, with spoils of slaughtered enemies. He slaughtered enemies, he collected war booty, everything. You have Al Makkah of Hiran. Al Makkah has granted him trophies, spoils, and captives. This is the first century BC. Oh my right? days, okay. And then you've got another guy, the eighth century BC, who speaks of Al Makkah granting them control of the incense route and crushing the kingdoms of Asan and Nashan. This idea of a federator, the war god, goes way back. So Muhammad borrowed this from this tradition that he inherited. Yeah, and I mean, ju ju just that theme of, of the, the expedition of war, slaughtering the other or enemies, taking war booty and captives. If your god is granting you trophies, spoils and captives, I mean, this is the underlying like notion of what is, you know, like what A, how Islam was spread and, and what they did while they were spreading it, but also the foundations of what it promises Muslim men and the whole concept of that, even yeah. pertaining to the hereafter. Captives, trophies, yeah. spoils, and Muhammad was wow. a caravan robber, just like this guy. Exactly. And his God gave him leave to do it. Yeah. So this idea is not new. Not new at all. He's he actually. I mean, because I, I honestly thought like maybe there were elements of Muhammad's personality, obviously infiltrating Islam and making it a lot more, you know, maybe darker or, or subjective towards women based on his own life. But the fact that this idea is enshrined in a concept where this is something al makkah is granting you and this is the kind of like you know like like blessedness that's being bestowed on you it it, it just that's exactly <laughs> what allah did exactly it, it's what it's what muhammad's god did and offered him and gave him and and empowered him to do and commanded the rest of his believers to do so wow this so the parallel is there it's 100 percent to me it's 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 a clear parallel you know, yeah, you've got exactly. Al-Makkah, who was also called Allah, as we saw in the coins. Al-Makkah, mm -hmm. also known as Allah, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. So now, um, yeah, we, I should do a talk on jihad at some point. Yeah, nothing is new in Islam. Yeah, that's for sure. So let's look at some inscriptions. Well, Muhammad right? was most definitely a de facto caravan robber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, Muhammad mm -hmm. was a caravan robber. I mean, now... So let's have a look at some South Arabian inscriptions by translator A. Jame or whatever. So there was a Wam temple, the temple of Al-Makkah. Okay, this was next to the temple of Bilqis, or it was the temple of Bilqis in Yemen. Or they were very close. There was a there was a there were three temples very close to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And when he sacrificed to Attar, and when he established the whole community united by a god and a patron and by a pact and a secret treaty, by Attar and by Habas and by Ilumku, right? But notice, so, okay, well, so al Makkah was the lunar god. Notice in this reference, a lunar god, a moon god. al Makkah is a moon god, not a sun god. The first yeah. divinity of the Sabaean pantheon, okay? And yet Habas, another name of the Sabaean lunar god. So that's al Makkah again, just under another name. Yeah. And then you have Sim, the name of the lunar god, honored as the god who listens to, the god who hearkens to. Again, the same god. Interesting. So you've got all these references. Lunar God, Lunar God, Moon God, Moon God, Moon God. al was a yeah. Moon God. There's, there's too many references. I mean, there are dozens in this presentation, which 
these scholars are all saying it's a moon god, moon god, moon god, moon god, just ongoing. Yeah. Right? Let's look at this one. Okay. They're talking of Wad, the moon god. Okay. Wad was another, was it, Wad wasn't really a god. So basically, Wad, I think, means love. I, can't, I could be wrong, but I think Wad means love. It's just one of the names of Allah. It's one of the names, okay. one of the characteristics. And they oh, just finally like love props up somewhere. Oh, they wiped, they wiped it. <laughs> what was it long before? You, yeah. you know, Muhammad, his favorite <laughs> saying was, how can I love you if you won't lie down? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, but I, I take that. <laughs> you know, he wasn't exactly a romantic, I'm right? Ready for, no, he most definitely was not. Um, so, but, yeah. Yeah. So now notice, again, Wad is a moon god. So now Wad mm -hmm. would seem to be, again, the same god, or you know, a different tribe using Wad, but Wad's the moon god. They all had, they all shared the moon god. Okay? And then there are frequent references in the Sabaean. This is the Yemeni text to this guy, Baal's bull. So it looks like al Makkah was also called Baal. And we know that yeah. Baal was al Makkah and al Makkah was Allah. Mm -hmm. and he's, yeah. So now you've got Baal back in the picture. Yeah. And Baal was not what we'd call a friendly god, right? Yeah, exactly. So Baal, in this case, being the moon god, okay, now this now in this scholarly document, they confirm it. It was al Makkah. Baal yes. was al Makkah. Yeah. Again, okay. back, to, back his... to the war the war god as opposed to anything else. Yep. And Baal of the Bible, right? Baal was the evil god. They Remember, they sacrificed their children to Baal. They, they passed their mm -hmm. children to the fire in front of Baal, and they... So Jeremiah, they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech. Molech is Baal. Baal is al Makkah. al Makkah is Allah. Oh, wow, Lloyd. Can you say that one more time? Well, yeah. So Baal is Molech. Molech mm. is al Makkah. al Makkah is Allah. Wow. Okay. Because yeah. one of the names of al Makkah is Allah. Exactly. Right? But that's on the coins. That's on the inscription on the coins. I think I showed that already. Yeah. So which I have. commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So this passage explicitly in the Bible links Baal to Molech. Mm -hmm. And here Baal is linked to al Makkah, and al Makkah is Allah. So understand, this is pagan to the core. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? And you've got now in this, uh, this is, I think... Um, this is, it's not Strong's. It's one of the similar ones. So now you've got Baal, perhaps the same as having a well. Okay, so Baal, they may be perhaps the same town as whatever, having a well. So now Baal, the god Baal, is also linked to a place having a well. Do you know of a place that has a well that's very important? Mecca. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a magical Zamzam -zam well. <laughs> yeah, I understand. It's just, no, look, again. It's like it, this on its own is just a coincidence, perhaps. But when you're mm -hmm. looking at this, 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 this growing stack of constant connections, constant, you know, it's it's pretty uh, uncanny, Lloyd. Like you, you, you can't get away from it. These subtle, tiny kind of like clues here and there, or just just the the kind of way the names have been used and they're interchangeable, or they could like I was just thinking when you made that last point you were just mentioning um, Makkah and Allah in one sentence, but the way my brain is now computing those two terms, as opposed to when I'm a Muslim praying five times a day and I think of Allah and Makkah, I'm imagining something so far removed from what you and I are discussing right now. Yeah, well, think. Okay, so hang, hang on, you know, let me let me just do this. You just said something, right? So, okay, so we've got, okay, so remember the, the Q in the Yemeni dialect of Arabic becomes a K in the in the Arabian Arabic, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So in the in the Saudi Arabic, whatever. So the Q, the K becomes, right? Becomes K, right? So you said Allah, okay? Al Makkah, right? So when you said when you said Allah and Al Makkah, Allah and Makkah, Allah, you say when you think of Allah Al Makkah, okay? Allah is Al Makkah. Maybe if you run the two names together, you get Allah Al Makkah. Right, mm -hmm. Allah of Al Makkah, or Allah in Al Makkah, or Allah sure. is Al Makkah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of like Allah Mecca, Allah, you know, yeah. Allah and Makkah run together. So Allah is in Mecca, Allah is yeah. in Makkah. Uh, yeah, that, that would make sense completely. You know, after everything we've done now, so so now let's tie north to south. Okay, so now we've been in the south in Yemen for a while. So let's go back north into Mesopotamia, directly into Babylon. Right. So if I go back here, so if we go to see if I can find Hatra. 
Atra, Iraq. Okay, fantastic. Let's go there. So now we go north to Hatra. So this is the great ziggurat of Ur, and this is mm -hmm. Hatra, northern Iraq, very close to Syria, and not that far from Haran. Okay. okay. This place, Hatra, was an Arabic outpost. So these guys, from all the way down here, went and established themselves four or so city-states that ran along here. This was the most important one, Hatra. Mm -hmm. It was its own little independent city-state. And because they were traders, they had temples to all of the gods of the region because they wanted okay. everybody to come spend their money. Yes, they Don't wanted forget, to accommodate all of them. Now in Mecca, they had gods of all the place, of all the, of all the tribes in Mecca because they wanted everyone to spend their money there, right? It was a market. Mm -hmm. Same concept. So Hatra was an ancient city in Upper Mesopotamia located in present-day eastern Nineveh government in northern Iraq. The caravan city... Okay, caravan mm -hmm. city. It flourished in the second century. It was destroyed and deserted in the third century. It was rediscovered in the 19th century. It's called Al Hadr in Arabic and recorded as Hatra in Aramaic inscriptions. It was known in the Aramaic. The city was famed for its fusion of Greek, Mesopotamian, Canaanite, Aramean, and Arabian pantheons. These were Arabs, don't forget. Yeah. Officially called Beit Elaha, the house <gasps> of Allah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so familiar. My alarm bells are ringing. Oh my gosh. We have Ahlul Bayt. In... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Is, oh. is that the same phrase? <laughs> kind of with a little. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in Aramaic inscriptions, okay, so it's recorded as the Bayt Alachai in Aramaic inscriptions and recorded as the enclosure of Shamash as well on a coin. So Shamash is the partner of Allah. That's the sun god. Yes. Sun okay. Goddess. Yeah. Yeah, okay. which makes sense, right? The moon and sun either, like, yep. uh, and that's remember, why there was... Remember on the doors of the Kaaba, you have the sun and the moon. The doors of the Kaaba, you have the sun and the moon, symbols. On the oh, doors wow. of the Kaaba. Oh, my yeah, gosh. You didn't know that? No, okay, I let didn't. Let I didn't it. think there was anything to, to do. Let me figure out where I am. I'm on... Okay, so hold on. Let me find you the Kaaba. Uh, let's, let's just actually just go here. Yeah, sure. Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay, yeah, I've seen, I've, I've seen, obviously, I've seen this so many times. I never paid attention like this. <laughs> So understand, you've got here the sun and the moon, oh right? And this word. is the old door before this one. This was the sun symbol on it. Oh, my word. Yeah, okay. So that was really because of, they've obviously changed it since, right? But so that's what it was. been six doors. Apparently, that covers had six doors. Okay. Six different doors. Yeah. So, yeah, so back to this. Yeah. So mm -hmm. hopefully that, that makes sense to you, you know? So this was the capital of possibly, so remember, it was called the House of Allah, the Beit al -Aha. The Ahlul mm -hmm. Bayt. Ahlul right? Bayt, yeah. Capital of possibly the first Arab kingdom in the chain of Arab cities running from Hatra by Palmyra, Baalbek to Petra. Wow, okay. Back to Petra now. Back to okay, Petra. So now, and the city had temples to Nergal, the Assyrian, Babylonian, and the Akkadian god to Hermes, Greek. And don't forget, Hermeticism was also Haran, the whole idea of Hermeticism, which is like the forerunner of Gnosticism. Gnosticism mm -hmm. is like a more radical hermeticism, but again, don't don't quote me on this, right? Uh, but anyway, so anyway, at Urgatis, you had the Surah Aramean, then you had Alat, you had Shamia, or Arabian <laughs> gods, you had Shamash, okay, yeah. who was Mesopotamian, but also Arabian. You had other deities mentioned in the Hatran Aramaic inscriptions that were the Baal Shamun. Well, Baal Shamun is around Petra, wow, right? And of okay. course, we know that now that Amaka was Baal, yes, right? Baal is yes. Allah. Yes. Well, Baal is Al-Makkah, and Al-Makkah is Allah, yes. and the female deity, and so on. And then earlier rulers were titled the Lord, and later ones were the Malik, the Arab, the king of the Arabs, the Malka, the king. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, Hatra is located, as you can see, in Iraq, northern Iraq. And so, yeah, another term, Malik, the Malka, the king, yes. the Malik. All of these things just somehow tied together, right? Yes. So now... Okay, now I may have some typos here. I forgot. I needed to fix these. I may just so I'm okay. So just let me. I, I, I have no worries. Notes, we can forgive I typos. To go back and fix it. I just completely forgot. Mm. So you're in the Quran, you have Yasin, the heart of the unholy Quran. Okay. Oh, did you know that the okay, the reason I call the Quran often the Quran often the Quran is that this is the name of the KKK holy book. Okay. The holy book of the KKK is called the Quran. Oh my goodness. Okay? Right, and do you know what the first symbol of the KKK was? Their first patch, their first symbol. Okay, guess what their first symbol was? No, don't say like a crescent moon and a star. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> no. Kristen Freeman and a scarf. Yes. Oh my god. Didn't I show you that before? No, I don't think we've made a reference to the KKK. I didn't mm -hmm. even know that their uh, book was called the Quran. This is. <laughs> uh, okay, hold on. Tell you what, let's let's have a quick deviation to the KKK. Oh my since gosh, we are why are you taking me down this wormhole? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, what is with my internet today? That's really slow. Okay, so let me just go down. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, oh, by the way, okay, so since we're here, Baphomet, you've heard of Baphomet, right? No, I haven't. This is the, this is the, this is the satanic god Baphomet. You've, okay. You haven't heard of Baphomet? No. Okay, so modern scholars agree that the name of Baphomet was an old French corruption of the name Muhammad, with the interpretation being that some of the Templars had begun mm -hmm. incorporating Islamic ideas, which was documented by the Inquisitors as heresy. Before the Templar defenders jump in the chat, there's stuff about the Templars that you don't know. Everyone loves the good things about the Templars. They don't yeah. realize the Templars went bad. The Templars went very bad towards oh, the end. Okay. Okay. But this is the this is the okay. So if you go to the Temple of Satan today, right? This mm -hmm. is their god. This is their symbol, their god symbol. This is Baphomet. Baphomet was Muhammad. <laughs> This is the symbol of the Temple of Satan. Okay? Oh my gosh. In okay. the Chanson de Simon Pu, okay, written before 1235, a Sarasan Islamic idol is called the Baphomets. Okay, wow. the Sarasan Islamic idols. A chronicle of the First Crusade, Raymond of Aguirre, called mosques Baphomarias. What? And then you've got, in the trial of the Templars, one of their main charges was their supposed worship of a heathen idol head known as a Baphomet, Muhammad. The Templars wow. were worshipping Muhammad. And that was an old French corruption of the name Mohammed. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence on that. There's, there's plenty. I'll give you this one. So in John of Damascus mentioned the Saracens derived from Saras Kenoy or destitute of Sarah because of what Hagar said to the angel. Sarah hath sent me away destitute. They worshipped the morning star and Aphrodite known as al Ila. Oh my God, yeah. Who they called Kebar, which means great. Oh, Akbar. Yeah. Akbar, yes, exactly. And you have a town. Kabir been to and before. great in size or dignity. Sorry, Congrats. I just feel like that's important Congrats. because that's attached to the whole, like Allahu Akbar in general is saying that my God is the biggest in size and in dignity, obviously. It doesn't mean God is great, as we're often told. But yeah. again, my rock is bigger than your rock. Yes, precisely. My rock is bigger than your rock and the right. biggest and the last. There will never be a bigger um, rock. So now notice the word Baphomet first turned up in a letter of 1098 written by Anselm of Ribabont, who fought in the First Crusade. Describing their lead up to a clash with Muslim soldiers, he wrote how as the next day dawned, the Muslims called loudly upon Baphomet. Oh my word, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, they called loudly upon Baphomet while we prayed silently in our hearts to God, and then we attacked and forced all of them outside the walls. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that, that, that's obviously a direct. reference to Muhammad. Now, yeah, so Baphomet had no Muhammad. association with Satan until the 20th century. Before that, okay. Baphomet was Muhammad. Okay. This, okay. Is, Just thought you might this is mad find for that me. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to show you. So let's have a look at. So while we're here, um, so this is the Ku, the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> so this, so this is the holy book of the KKK, the Klan. Oh my God! How did I? Oh my God! Okay. Yep. It's derived from the Islamic Quran. The earliest symbol of the KKK was not a cross. It's not a cross. The first symbol was the Islamic crescent and star. And then they thought maybe that's a bit too on the nose. And they well, how about this is derived, the, being derived from the Quran? Isn't that a bit too on the nose? Is that really like that? Very few people have made the connection, believe me. Okay, I, I know. I discussed, I, this. I discussed this on a show three years ago. And two weeks later, uh, David Wood mentioned it in his show that the book was called the Quran, but he missed this part. So notice this is one of the, this is the oldest known uniform of the KKK, and you'll notice a crescent oh God, and a star. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. i continue. This is another photograph. This is the oldest known uniform. Of, this is the original. This is attested to be the original uniform of the KKK. It's got the Islamic crescent and star on it. Oh, my days. Lloyd, I, I, I'm just so also intrigued now about the, the Quran. We need to we need to go into that at some point. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Prophet speak though. I thought the Quran was a typo. I thought that was a typo when Lloyd started talking about typos. No, like, there's some crazy stuff. Seriously, when you start to look, 
if I, I can give this presentation at some point, and when you start to look at the occult connections in Islam, to the Freemasons, to some crazy things, believe me, it's going to blow your mind. The connections okay. to the Nazis, the connections to the Freemasons, the connections to, to occultism, it is insane. Okay, no, Lloyd, we need to we need to deep dive into this at some point. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I just thought you'd find that interesting. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, also, for instance, I just want to oh, say, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go on. No, please go on. Please go on. I just wanted to say, um, we have Ray, the producer, in the house. Um, Ray Ray has done a rap song in English. So if you haven't already checked it out, please. I watched it. It was really good. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh, Lloyd. Oh, I watched yeah. these. I watched these. Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yeah. No. Really, really well done. So if you haven't checked it out, please type Ray, the producer, in YouTube and go subscribe to his channel. Um, and check out his latest English rap. It really, really is um, really off the hook. The lyricism, the way he's composed it, the little digs at Ali Dawa and Daniel Hakika Chu. <laughs> it's a treat. So please do go check it out. Yeah. While we're here, I may as well just... Um, yeah. So so look, so the Freemasons... Okay, so you've got the Freemasons, and we, we will discuss them another time. But sure. above the Freemasons, there's another group called the Shriners who have nothing to do with Islam at all, promise. <laughs> Wallahi, okay. okay. Nothing to do, mm -hmm. okay. So, except that they are entirely one hundred percent Islamic. I'll just briefly run into that. <laughs> so, to become to become a Shriner, you have to first be a Mason. So, if you're a Shriner, you're definitely a Mason. If you're a Mason, you're not necessarily a Shriner, but if you're a Shriner, you're a Mason. Right. Notice they wear the fez. The fez is from Fez Morocco, where six thousand Jews were killed. Okay, blah blah blah. It's the official headgear. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into a long story, but when you join them. You, you have to become, okay, so when you join them, uh, okay, so when you join them, you have to go through a whole series of stuff and you've got to say amongst, may Allah, the God of the Arab, Muslim and Mohammedan, the God of our Father, support me to the entire fulfillment of the same, amen, amen, amen. So then you be, that's, your, that's part of your right of entrance to become a, after you're a Freemason, you become a Shriner. Now notice, these are not Muslims, these are white American guys, okay? Yes. So, and uh, notice, these are all famous Shriners. Douglas MacArthur, Gerald Ford, John Wayne, Jade Gahoover, Harry Truman. Notice, do you see the Islamic shrine and the sword of Muhammad? Sorry, crescent and star and the sword and the of sword. Muhammad. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Like nothing to do with Islam, of course. <sighs> right. What is going nothing. on? Nothing. Right. Do you understand? These are the guys hanging around the president, all of these shriners. And you start looking into it, and they mention the secret knowledge symbolized by the crescent. And they talk of, and basically, they are formed because of Ali. They're not Islamic at all, nothing mm -hmm. to do with Islam, okay? And if you look at their founding document, they were founded under by the Mohammedan Caliph Ali, whose name be praised, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. Oh nothing my to God. do with Islam. Nothing to do with Islam at all, just the son-in-law of the Prophet Ali, who obviously the Shias also follow, um, give a lot more credence to yep. than Muhammad himself. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's something to be talked about. Their first temple was sure. called the Mecca Temple. They called the AAONMS, which is an anagram of a Mason. Mason. Their, um, they, they, so, so notice the address of their Masonic Hall is on 114 East 13th Street. There's 114 chapters in the Quran. <laughs> oh my God, okay? Lloyd, yes. And their okay. first shrine is called Mecca Shrine. Okay. And uh, oh, by the way, just so you know, the Masonic sword of Allah. So the original, the origin of the, of this would, so this was the black flag of Islam. They were pirates. Wow. Okay. When, when, when would you say, so when was this flag that we're talking about here? Uh, this is the, well, before I go, I'll just, I'll, let me just briefly run through this one sure. and we'll come back to it next time. Okay. Have a look here. This is, this is, notice, this is a minaret. This chair shaped like an Islamic minaret. Yeah. This is a guy with the fez on, an Islamic fez. Okay, he's a white dude. And look at the crossed Islamic swords on the desk. Is that a Quran? I don't know. But notice, this is the black flag of jihad. Yeah. Same crossed swords. These are Freemasons, right? And here you've got the same Jolly Roger. Yeah. Seen at a distance, this is how it looks. Yeah. Oh my okay? gosh. Okay. When you this superimpose nice. them, that's what you get. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And this is one of these, apparently, this, I, this could be fake. I mean, I, I have to stand corrected here, but I found this. I can't find much detail on it. But, yeah, that's the Islamic sword, and that's a beheading for sure. Bloody hell. 
yeah, there's a lot more to this that goes on. So yeah, I just wanted to there bring must that up. Be, yeah, even Ray has um, really kindly shared a link here on the opinions with the striking similarities between jihadis and KKK. Um, so yeah, definitely go Excellent. check out Thanks, that. Thanks, Ray. I will have to look that up. You know, I need, I need to make a note of that because I'd like to dig more into that. But notice also they burn the cross. Burning the cross is a sign of sacrilege. Remember, the yes. KKK burns the cross. That's sacrilege. Yes, That's not true. respect or devotion. That's a false yeah. flag. Yeah. So, yeah, to finish. So, <laughs> Sorry, so Louis. Ray, Ray also says we have to also talk about the Christian connection to the KKK. No, just granted. To keep it Look, granted. But then that would be a violation of Christian doctrine, whereas in Islam, it would simply be following Islamic doctrine. But that would be a violation of Christian doctrine. So, I mean, diddling little girls would go against Christian doctrine and against Western law, which is derived morally from Christian doctrine. Right. Whereas if you look at diddling little girls, it is perfectly legal in Islam. Barbary pilots, pirates, Islamic. Yeah, America's first war was against the Barbary pirates who were extorting money from the Americans. The Marines were founded for the purposes of fighting the Barbary pirates. That's why they go to the shores of Tripoli, because they went to go and rescue Americans who'd been kidnapped. The, pub, the, the Muslims were, were extorting like 20% of America's GDP at the time. The first war America fought was, was against jihadis. So, yeah, so so let's finish this. So, yeah, so hopefully that was an interesting, um, the KKK was founded by Democrats. That is true. So, yeah, you got to wonder. So, Yasin, this is the heart of the unholy Quran. The meaning of Yasin, according to Islamic scholars, is unknown. It is debated amongst Muslim scholars. One interpretation is it means, oh, human being. Okay, it is representative of, of the divine origin of the book. It is the heart of the Quran. Well, we also know that Ya is the early name. Remember we had El? Ya is also one of the names of a moon god. It's actually the name of a of an Egyptian moon god. And two, yeah. Sin. We know who Sin is. So now you've got two moon gods juxtaposed right next to each other. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's and and Lloyd, trust me, as a Muslim, I would like be banging my head against a brick wall being like, why why do Muslims just put their hands up and say, Allah knows best? And we don't know what this means in, in its entirety. And then they kind of fall back on the fact that some of the Quran is just, you know, um, like metaphorical and we'll never really know the true meaning of the poetry the first time i think i was listening to some, maybe a christian prince debate or something and that was the first time that i got a more like relevant sincere explanation that yasin could be referring to the moon god sin or the god sin and i went and looked it up and i was there was heaps of information and i was like here you've got the muslim scholars scratching their heads telling us oh we don't know we don't know it's beautiful just say it recite it <laughs> and then you've got somebody making the direct link. So thank you for this. This is what I'd like. This is, I've definitely been waiting for this part. Yeah, I'll skip this. But I mean, so basically in the Quran, they also fiddle this whole story with Yasin. They fiddle this whole thing. They, they, they mess it. I mean, seriously, it's obviously they're just not being honest in the translations. I'll skip yeah. this. But I mean, really, they just, they just mess around here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you've got al Kamar, the moon, which is yeah. one of the names of the moon gods. This is one of the phases of the moon, okay? The full moon, not the full moon, but the whole moon, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have Ar-Rahman. We know that was originally God, right? The God Yahweh, the, the Jewish God, right? And the God of the Christians. Al-Buruj, the stars. I mean, these names, these might be wrong, right? Hey, Norse mythology. Wow, you have some great fans. So, yeah, thank you so much, Norse mythology, for your support and all your engagement in the chat. We really, really do appreciate it. And in the comments and in, with the controversy. Uh, so yeah. thank you so much for keeping it real. Go ahead. Sam. Yeah, Percy Wales mentioned something very relevant. The Catholic mm -hmm. Church has had more papal bulls denouncing Freemasonry than any other than any other um, organization or topic, right? The the Catholic Church has come out heavily, I mean heavily, against Freemasonry. They 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 consider it a complete heresy, and they they state very bluntly, you cannot be a Christian and a Freemason, at least within Catholic doctrine. You cannot be a Christian and a Freemason, and if you are a Freemason, then you're you, that's basically you're excommunicated. Or you've excommunicated mm. yourself so so yeah they've, they've come down very hard but that's i mean discussion again for another time but thanks for yeah that, thank you for clarifying that um as well lloyd and, wow. and touching on that point abdurrahman thank you so much for your support i hope you're enjoying this because i'm absolutely like loving it but yeah thank you all so much so thank then you've got Al-Malik. Al mm -hmm. molek now we know that molek is related to baal baal is related to al makkah and al makkah is allah so there you go that's baal okay and he was also the akkadian god mulek was molek you have Al-Tariq, the morning star. I said these numbers may be wrong. I need to go back and check them. I could have made typos there or just whatever, mixed it up. Was sure. Venus, Sirius, and Canopus. Now, we know that Allah is the Lord of Sirius. Sin was the Lord of Sirius. Sin was the father of Sirius. And if Allah is the Lord of Sirius, then Allah is Sin. Exactly, yeah. 
right? Canopus was the, is the second brightest star in the sky, and we know that the, the Kaaba is pointed at Canopus. The Kaaba is oriented to point directly at Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky, because wow. the Kaaba itself represents Sirius. Okay. And I showed I'm you like, that before, right? Uh, uh, no, I don't think I've, I've uh, maybe it slipped my mind, but I don't remember I learning that many facts for sure. But so Lloyd, I also just wanted to ask you, um, obviously you talked about the, the pillars and the Kaaba and stuff, but is there a reason why, because even the original Kaabas, I've said like the very first Kaabas that appeared, they all had that cube shape. Is there a reason behind that in itself? Like to make a cube object? Well, so all I can give you is my personal conspiracy yeah, yeah. theory. View. That, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I'm here for, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, seriously, at this point, I'm going to have to go all Alex Jones with David Icke. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I, I see. mean, seriously. So, so basically, uh, hold on. I'm just going to go. So, so this is my idea. Kufr means to cover, okay, to cover something, right? Mm -hmm. And a cube. So, hold on. Uh, cube. Unfolded. I'm just going to. Just, my typing is terrible. Unfolded. <laughs> no worries. So, so this is this is something a friend of mine said one time. Okay. So a friend of mine sent me this and said, Lloyd, think of this. When you take a cube mm -hmm. and you unfold a cube, it becomes a cross. Yeah. Yeah, we so built, we put, Kaaba, we'll literally built cubes like this in school, right? From this exact... So the cube is a method they speak of. Remember, Islam projects. It projects everything. It's, so it's kufr. When they speak of it's kufr, covering the truth. Kufr. Remember, kufr is from covering to cover the truth. Kufr... So they are covering the truth. They're covering the cross. They're hiding the oh cross. Oh my gosh! Okay, okay. I literally see what you're getting at. If they, if they if this is the case, they have they have really really done their homework on how to like, I mean like whatever you know you, you accept as the truth. But if that's what they're going up against, they've done everything to pretty much push it down. Like kind of you know, shove it into the cupboard, push it into the dark, get rid of all traces of it. And in such a kind of subtle yet really like dark and twisted symbolic way. Manner. Really symbolic, yeah. Like somebody's really kind of thought about this. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, I, I, I have no evidence to prove that, but I mean, but this is something that someone said to me, they kind of like, I was like, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Yeah, so on that point, I will take that as a given what you've just said there. And I, I agree with you because um, there are references to, so let's, let's, let's deviate again. Uh, we'll go for a few minutes and then we'll call it a night because yes, I have a busy sure, day again. Tomorrow, but... Yeah. 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 And, and we are over so the two cover, hour mark. So whenever you want to wrap it up. Now again, I, the, I've also noticed there's nothing wrong with me repeating stuff because people forget and I need to reinforce these points, but notice this is the Kaaba and notice here the lamps. You know, someone mentioned you have the lamps in the sky. Well, you've got the lamps and you've got the moon. Notice the moon and the lamps. Yeah, yeah. Next to the Kaaba, you have the crescent moon, you have the Kaaba, and you've got yeah. the pillars in the Kaaba, right? Yeah. So now you've got that and you've got the people. Now, so the question is, where's the sun? You've got the moon, you've mm -hmm. got the lamps. Oh my gosh, yeah. Okay, now we need to find the stars and the sun. So now let's go on a little hunt and look for the stars and the sun. Right, so this is the view inside. Remember the Kaaba? I remember I showed you the Hadith that showed it used to have six pillars, just like the temples of Al Makkah. Now they've only got three, but that's fine because if you look at the bull symbol of Al Makkah, it's only got three pillars on its head. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The bull yeah, symbol yeah. of Al Makkah has three pillars on its head. Mm -hmm. Right? Now let's have a look here. So now you've got, so the Kaaba is the representation. This is God's house on earth as he has a house in heaven, and all the stars go around. His house in heaven, anti-clockwise. Yeah. That's what we do when we are doing circumambulating. Yeah. Right. And then here is the sun. You see, that's the sun. And the Kaaba is the is Sirius, the north star is the North Star. Oh wow, okay. okay. And the Kaaba is oriented to point directly to the second brightest star in the sky called Canopus. So it is Sirius, it points to Canopus, it is astrological. Wow. Okay. I mean, that that's what even like, you know, you kind of get a faint idea of, but I just thought they were trying to mimic again, like, you know, the celestial bodies and stuff. And obviously that's part of the circumambulation, but th this representation with the kind of the moon lighting, the lamps, the, then the, the cube there itself, and then the concept yeah. of Tawaf or so like it, now, like from a bird's yeah. eye view, it kind of makes a lot more sense in that way for sure. And then 
every time so you so basically you come around you see the moon and there's a there's a prayer you've got to say every time you see this corner of the moon here every time you see the hutton this little wall every time you come around and you see this hutton as you come around here and you see that you have to say a particular yeah. incantation it's true right it's very true yeah and then this question by d isn't that where the famous document of america not being a christian nation stopping muslim pirates i'm not sure america technically is a christian nation i'm not saying the government is very christian or very uh, you know I mean, the government's clearly messed up but but americans are largely still christian and their constitution where whether people want to argue about it or not is very much christian in in its i mean the declaration of independence the constitution the um and a couple of others these documents are very much you can see there's a very strong theistic christian element to them but i mean that's that's out of scope but they stopped the muslim pirates because the the muslims were, i mean that's an interesting story the history of that okay so um yeah, thank you yeah. Lloyd, for answering that thank you so much d for your super chat and your support always yeah if you can just rephrase that for me uh, I'll, I'll have a look into it and try and answer it better than next time okay so let's finish this section and then i will i will go up to Graven, I think, yeah, because I've done some of these out of sequence in the past, you know. Yeah, you've done Graven so, Idol as well before. So, yeah, just just wherever you're happy to wrap it up. So, then you've got now Saba, the, the, the Quran mentions, okay, the dam break at Marib, right? And then Jeddah, okay, we'll skip that. That's not that critical. Now, Allah is the Lord of Sirius, right? We've mentioned An Najm and Astan. He alone is the Lord of Sirius. Allah alone is the Lord of Sirius. Well, Sin was the Lord of Sirius. Sirius was worshipped by Nabonidus. Right, was one of the pantheon yeah. of gods. Sin was the major god, and then Nabana, and then Sirius would have been the the son of the moon and the sun, or the child yeah. of the moon and the sun. Okay, only once is Islam mentioned in the Quran by its old Arabic name, and that he's the Lord of Al Shira. Okay, Al Shira is the star Alpha Canis Majoris, or Sirius, the brightest oh fixed god. star in the sky, the Kaaba. Yeah. Sirius was worshipped by Arab tribes in the Jahiliyyah before Islam. Oh. It is now serious that Allah, creator of all beings, is also the Lord of Sirius. Sin was the head of this pantheon, and in Al Jalalain. In Tafsir, he says, this is a star beyond the constellation of Gemini, which was worshipped in the time of pagandom, the Jahiliyyah. Ibn Abbas tells us, and that he it is who is the Lord of Sirius, which was worshipped by the Khazan. So they admit it. Yeah, they admit it. Right. Ibn Abbas admits it. And in and to be fair, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. No, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, sorry. And Quran.com admits that this is a star worshipped by ancient pagans. <laughs> It's in the Quran itself. It's in Quran.com itself. Yeah. Right here. Nothing new here. Nothing new. Yeah. I mean, it's like just so convenient, isn't it? Yeah. And the fact that they actually and, say ancient pagans, you know, they, they don't even try and rectify the whole, uh, you know, at least it's been monotheistic since day dot. No. <laughs> and then notice female nominative proper noun. Shin. Yes. Sin. The moon yeah. shin, the, the pronunciation is shin. Oh my gosh. And 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 Lloyd, in your entire, like, since you've done, no Islamic scholar that you know of has ever kind of made this link to sin from Yasin or Yasin when they read it. Look, academics, a lot of this work is in vertical. Look, I think what I'm doing is I'm trying to connect across these vertical silos. Mm. I'm trying to connect across and make links across. Because I think the scholars... When I read some of these documents, these papers, these academic research materials, it's like they want to say it, but they won't say it. They want to draw a conclusion, but they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want the money to dry up. They don't want to get beheaded because we know that doesn't happen. You don't have to worry because it's the religion of peace, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, like who was that, that man you showed us earlier as well? He was completely safe with his liberal views, wasn't he? No. There you go. So understand. So, yeah. and then I'll I'll sort of we'll wind down here at this point. Sure. So Gobekli Tepe. We mentioned Gobekli Tepe before, right? So Gobekli Tepe, that particular site itself, is mm. nineteen circular temples. Okay. So you've got the main temple, and, and it's surrounded by like eighteen or nineteen little circular temples within that one site. But away from that area, around that area, within within like you know, within that geographical region, there's at least 19 other temples like it. Okay. And yeah. I showed there's at yeah. least 19 other temples like it. And there's one that is even older than Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe is like 14 or 15,000 years old. And there's one that's possibly 2000 years older. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And notice according to new scientist. Now this is not Wikipedia and I did not write this myself. 
Okay, I'm assuming it's new scientist. I'm going to try and trust the science on this one. Hopefully it's not tobacco science, but let's go on. The world's oldest temple was built to worship the dog star, Sirius. New research has revealed that the world's oldest temple, Gebekli Tepe in southern Turkey, was probably built to worship the star Sirius. Damn, okay. If, if the Kaaba is Sirius. Yeah. Yeah, and there's one temple that's at least 15,000 years old. It's older. That's the yeah, scary then part. Older than Gebekli Tepe. Now remember, they were, the Gublaki Muslims Tepe. and Mohammedans were looking for the original religion of Abraham. And Abraham was in Iran. And this is just a few miles down. This is walking distance from Haran. Yeah, yeah. This would be the oldest religion. And if they, now this was buried. People say, well, this was buried. It was only uncovered a few years ago. Great. But there were, the, there's at least 19 other temples like it in the immediate area. Mm -hmm. So they would have known of this as the oldest temples in the world. So yeah. this would be the original religion of Abraham. I mean, they would have made the connection. The original religion, well, these are the oldest temples. Abraham was there. Bang. You know, Precisely. Probably... They, they would have put two and two together in that way. And, and just, so can we assume that the other 19 temples were all, uh, dedicated to the star Sirius in this case. We probably can, right? So, yeah, it's part of yeah. the same complex of temples. Okay. I showed wow. that earlier. I did show that. In yeah, the you did. Like you definitely have. Scattered around the region. Yeah, if you guys so, I mean, uh, you want to check out what Lloyd is referring to, it's in part three. I think it's in the last part previous to this. Um, he actually did show us, so. Yep, so the oldest temple was worshipped to the dog star. So if the Kaaba is Sirius, which is like, you know, then it's like the, the equivalent of Allah's palace in the sky versus on earth, then yeah. And this was certain. Now notice, notice here. Oopsie, look at that. Just like in Mecca, you've got the two minarets, and then they go ape when you have the sun or the moon between the minarets. They 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 love it. We'll get when when I yeah. end this presentation, you'll start to see. Actually, they they go they go wild about uh, the the. They actually love the idea of of bugger. It's it's. I've got it somewhere, but okay, fine. no worries. Is that also why they like to? Uh, put, I, I don't know if they like to say that Makkah is the center of the earth as well. Yes, they, they like to say the is. magnetic field, the center of the earth, and because it all fits into this. Yeah, because it's like as on a, as above, so below. So below, yeah, precisely. Okay, it's God's home on earth versus because mm -hmm. you know the stars are higher beings. Remember that proceed around God's throne. Yeah, 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 is. yeah. And well, that's his home on the earth. Wow. So, okay. So I can end here, maybe. Um, sure. So hopefully that was interesting. So yeah. So yeah, no, that, that was, was extremely oh, abhorrence, interesting. Yeah. Bosh it, abhorrence, yeah, abhorrence and shame. That's the other. Yeah. So Moloch, king of shame, king of the abhorrent king, the evil king. So, yeah. So so Moloch was actually a like um, like almost a perversion to them, right? Yeah. Okay. They were, des they were to destroy the Jews. Were to destroy all evidence of Moloch because he was evil. He, they remember they were sacrificing children. There were, um, there were, there was there was incest. There was you know all sorts of immorality and yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, Lloyd. Thank you so much for that today. Do you, do you want to do? Are you done? Do you want to wrap it up or did you want to say something? Yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. So the, this is what I wanted to show you guys earlier. Silm, the root of Islam, means graven idol. I won't go into full details, but. The, the silam, the root of Islam, they tell you it means peace, you know, mm -hmm. shalom, you know, whatever. And it's, salam means submission. Well, originally it meant graven idol. And remember the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, not worship take, graven maybe. idols. Yeah. And Allah in, he, in Strong's, okay, shows curse. So yeah, you oh work it out. Days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, uh, connect the dots. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So over to you. Thank you very much for your time, Nuria, for the audience. Thank you guys very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I think, I mean, I definitely learned a lot today. Today, I really genuinely felt a bit like, whoo, that was a lot of information because we're getting to like, obviously the really meaty substance now and all the, the things that we've discussed previously, which I'm obviously trying to like remember are coming together now and you kind of see the bigger picture unfolding before us and you see these uncanny connections. And then you kind of took us on a little wild um adventure about with the kkk and i was like oh my gosh i'm not even ready for this but that was a uh, very very enlightening and i can't wait to um if you ever want to kind of dig deeper into that for sure because i i i had no idea about these connections and i did not know that they were like this kind of striking even just from 
the like the way that the KKK symbols originated. I didn't even know about the Quran, to be honest. So I have a lot of homework to do, Lloyd. Um, but yeah, I just want to say <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, you no, so much. I hope everybody, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please. Uh, Oh, sorry. Thanks, guys. Really, really interesting. <laughs> Marish, thank you. Thanks, uh -huh. Josie. Yeah, yeah thank no, you, really, Josie. Really, it's a pleasure to 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 be here. Uh, yeah, and Josie, honestly, you're so engaging. So thank you so much. Um, you're very welcome, Allied Atheist Alliance. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Farish Ahmed. Today's lesson was mind-boggling. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, Thank you, Nuria and Lloyd. I learned so much. You are more than welcome, Agnostic Mujahid. Wow, what a name. <laughs> very, very glad yeah. you're an Agnostic Mujahid and not a Mujahid yeah, Mujahid. So what did you guys learn from this? I mean, what are you taking from this? You know, I, I'm trying to connect to it in dots. And I mean, this is the evidence that I, that I have. These are the resources. I've shown you my resource list. Mm. What are you guys taking away? I mean, do, does my thesis sound credible to you? you know, at the end of the day, the, 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 the public has to make a decision. Yeah, so guys, please, um, obviously in the comments when you watch this or after like the stream is done, please let us know. Uh, let us know what you think about Lloyd's take on all of this and all the research he's uncovered and, and whether you think it ties into like maybe the Petra theory substantially or it's a standalone theory in its own right or what it's kind of made you think about. But please do let us know because I think Lloyd as well, you would really benefit from this information and just see people from, you know, whichever stance you're coming from, how are you? Um, assimilating this information and that and and how do you kind of like rationalize it with everything else that you know so yeah do give us feedback and please 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 go and subscribe to Lloyd's channel um it is in the description he's oh sorry North mythology is saying yes sounds credible Lloyd um so hopefully we will get well, I honestly think Lloyd I, I think you're you're making movements here Murtez Murti, thank you so much for your super chat. Uh, Murtez is saying, I feel sorry for the Muslims. <laughs> yeah, watch out. Lloyd is coming for you, Muslims. Um, this information is going to dismantle Islam bit by bit. So, yeah, thank you so much. And just, I'm just going to go through a couple of these uh, comments just to wrap it up, Lloyd. Thanks, Lloyd. Thanks, Nuria. It's lots to think about. I add it to the Jerusalem thesis. Okay. So that's another way that it's being kind of like looked into Lloyd, if that's helping you out. Um, yeah, remember I said, I'm not trying to replace any of these. I think I'm complimenting them. I'm adding the, the, the South, which they've overlooked and Africa, Ethiopia, which I still have to finish my research. But you've got Ethiopia, you've got Yemen. Yemen is critical to Islam. It's very important. And this has been completely ignored. And I think I'm now adding that piece and I'm connecting Yemen now, the South to the North. I'm showing how the two are now interlinked, how the, so, because if all the focus is on the North. Yeah, precisely, which is why I found your work so appealing to begin with, because as you said, all the work is done to the North, but you couldn't help but feel that there are so many connections to Ethiopia and Yemen and, and the references and the geography, but the what you've unraveled and the connections you've made with the pagan kind of names and the mishmash of cultures, it is just, it, it, this is exactly what I wanted to say to you, what Allied Atheist Alliance is saying, that, you know, well, I, I obviously had a hunch when I looked into it, but uh, Atheist, uh, uh, Allied Atheist Alliance knew better and said, I knew Islam came from pagan origins, but I didn't realize how much of the early history was a fabrication, really interesting. And I think Lloyd, every, every part, you're just making it like more and more kind of evident and, and not just that, I, like, as I said to you, I genuinely thought there were subjective elements. Like, I understand you could have kind of copy pasted the idea that the idea of the gods, the pantheon could be kind of, you know, adapted in a certain way and kind of put in this monotheistic Allah, like superimposed. But things to do with like captives and war booty. I also thought maybe, okay, Muhammad was a product of his time, blah, blah, blah. And that was his personality coming out. But what you're showing when these gods actually represent these very things that are fundamental elements of jihad and being a Muslim and swearing the Shahada and loving Muhammad above everybody else, above your own parents, your own children. It all stems from this, this concept of this war God who, as we saw, is the same amongst that whole landscape and has just been chopped and changed. So, so yeah, I, honestly, mind boggling. I think I, <laughs> I need to um, take a hot minute and process all of this as well. But here you go, Lloyd. I think you're thank oh, you all thank so you. much for the feedback. Um, also a very kind comment from Agnostic Mujahid. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say Lloyd, really how do you find... feel about this? Oh, uh, there's a previous one above that that he mentions, oh, which you. is very kind. 
Um, that's very kind. Thank you very much. No, guys, look, I appreciate the support. Um, this has been obviously months of work digging through hundreds of documents. You know, again, my, my entire database is available to you, and I, I like to have overwhelming lists of facts You know that I'm not just making up an opinion. I'm hoping my opinion is based on, on a lot of supporting data. For sure. And Lloyd, how would you feel about this? Agnostic Mujahid is saying, I think I need to translate and put Arabic subtitles to this stream. Arabs need to see this and understand it. You're welcome. Yeah, look, I mean, on my channel, all my videos, you guys are welcome to to do with them what you like. You know, it's, it's freely available to everyone. My resources, as you know, I give away all my resources, all the research notes I, I give to people. And I, I have people that call me, speak to me, and I, I try and advise them and, you know, teach them and uh, but all my research notes are available. You guys are welcome to check the research for yourself. You know? mm -hmm. And we really, really appreciate that, Lloyd, as well. Uh, but yeah, Grey Jedi as well, just saying, yes, Yemen can't be ignored. After all, it was part of the early merchant trail. Um, and yeah, let's just wrap it up on this. Whatever way you choose to look at Islam is just full of lies. Um, I completely agree. So yeah, phenomenal work by Lloyd. Um, now subscribe to Lloyd. Thank you so much, guys. Go follow his channel. He's doing fantastic work. And uh, hopefully we'll keep seeing him um, on this channel as well. And we'll just keep uncovering the lies and exploring. So no, do give us feedback. Yeah, so I'll let you go now, Lloyd. Thank you. I will do it, guys. I promise. Yeah, go ahead. Honestly, chant, like, as Lloyd was saying, anything on his channel, you're more than welcome to do it. And uh, feel free to take anything from my channel and add subtitles as well. Yeah, we if do you need this. any help, drop it in the comments or, um, you know, contact me, um, you know, and I'll be, I'll try and help you where I can because I, I do, I do advise people. I do try and give advice, point to documents they know they'll need and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. And somebody else in the comments said earlier as well, if you need um, help with Arabic, then they, they speak Arabic and they're willing to help. Um, that's amazing. So please do send me an email at at gmail.com. Um, and I can also pass the information on to Lloyd as well. So that would really, really help. Everybody, you are so welcome. A massive, massive thank you to Lloyd. Um, you just came back from traveling and you still managed to like jump on and do this and stick to our timing. So thank you. And uh, let's see you back again soon. Yeah, so next week. Guys, I'll be back next week. So yeah, this weekend is tough for me, but um, probably next Wednesday I should be available. Next Tuesday, Wednesday. So maybe when yeah, we'll, we'll chat afterwards. Okay, thank you guys. Good night. Take care. Thanks thank everybody. Bye bye. Good night.